Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig. If you're a musician, I made a special three-question survey for you at everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash survey. Again, musicians only. Complete this three-question survey at everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash survey. All righty now, let's do this. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And um, I've got a really cool guest today, but I want to tell you a little story. So I rarely watch chick flicks but once in a while i have to because i've been married to my wife for 26 years and you know she wants to watch a chick flick so there happens to be one chick flick that we watch that's actually a really good movie it's called sliding doors and it's a good movie not because of the love story although that's kind of cute it's a good movie because they talk about alternative realities like and i'm really into that of you know if you make a left going down the street instead of go straight or if you get on the train one second late or you miss the train and get the next train how do these things impact your life and so it's a really interesting movie it's called um sliding doors it's from the late 90s and gwyneth paltrow's in there and it takes place in the uk so i don't know how i was talking to somebody a guitar player in the uk somehow about that movie and they said oh do you know paul stacy I was like, no. And they said, he was in that movie. And I said, no, tell me. He said, he's a, he's a, a really good guitar player, interesting guy. It was in the part when he's sitting on the train and the guy listening to the headphones. And I was like, yeah, because we had just seen it like three weeks before because I hadn't seen it in like four or five years. And I just said, hey, let's watch this movie. And they said, oh, you need to talk to Paul Stacy. So here's we got Paul Stacy on the show today. This guy is really cool. He's really interesting. He's done some really great stuff musically, extremely talented and uh, just a cool guy. So let me tell you a little about Paul and then we'll get into this. And uh, he's an actor. Uh, born in 63 on the south coast of England, he originally studied classical piano drama and dance at the age of six he continued with acoustic guitar from the age of nine at age 12 he moved on to electric and by 14 was playing the college rock circuit and also moved to london to study at stage school at 16 he joined the national youth jazz orchestra which resulted in playing in the london jazz scene for the next 20 years at 22 he enrolled at the drama center in london at 28 He recorded his first major jazz record with Tommy Smith, produced by Gary Burton at Rainbow Studios in Oslo. That's in Norway. I'm so proud of myself that as an American, I know Oslo is in Norway. I feel like I've evolved up the food chain because we don't know much about things outside of our country. Man, um, At 30, he joined the Lemon Trees. with He was one of the founding members of the Lemon Trees with Guy Chambers and also Paul's brother, Jeremy. They were signed to MCA Records, continued playing and recording in jazz and rock over the next few years until joining a world tour with Oasis in 1997, which then led to him... Uh, full-time production and composition and he's currently got a signed publishing deal with universal he's a london right now his primary thing he's doing he's a london-based producer and composer but he also plays guitar on a lot of the tracks he's working on he he works as a producer a mastering engineer or a mixer and he's worked with the black crows oasis the kooks the noisettes big linda future clouds and radar chris robinson and the new earth mud uncle which i'll talk to you about because i like them black car this is Moke, M-O-K-E, or Moke, yeah. Moke, Minuteman, sorry about that, Chris Squire from Yes, I'm going to mess this up, Betcha Dupa, did I mess that up? <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. I'm on a roll here. Kid Galahad and Claire Martin, he's played various instruments for and with most of those people, plus he's also done work with Madonna, KT Tunstall, the Finn Brothers, Narina Pallet, more Chiba, oh. what's that? Narina Palo. M- Narina Palo. Uh, I knew yeah. I was going to screw something. There's like 20 names here, man. I'm not good for 20 names. Paolo. 
Uh, more Chiba, Eddie Reader, Gary Husband, Steve Topping, Tommy Smith, Jason Rebello, Lawrence Cottle, and the Lemon Trees. In addition, he's worked with Doyle Bramhall on the Rich Man LP, Robbie Williams, and more. Again, he acted in the movie Sliding Door. He was also in Four Weddings and a Funeral. He played on Tom Jones' Praise and Blame Tour in November 2010. He also played in John Ilsley's band. John Ilsley's a bass player in Dire Straits for two years. And last year, he co-produced and engineered Stephen Will. Wilson's album from the was a porcupine tree tree porcupine, porcupine tree, yeah. tree yeah with great band uh, he produced Stephen Wilson's album who's a guitar player that band called to the bone and he also played a guitar solo on the track refuge and man he's an interesting guy with no shortage of cool shit to talk about so thanks for coming on the show Paul I really appreciate it thank you thank you for asking me and, yeah and we just had like a two-hour inter. we just had a like a like to our, our to our conversation to before the interview. So. No, I can't let's see. I have nothing else to say. We're done. Have a good night. Yeah. <laughs> Man, um, you're so creative and you've been creative across a lot of different disciplines. Music, acting, dance, production, engineering. And, you know, if I go back to your background, it seems like you've always had this, you know, wide variety of talents and were enamored and attracted to all these things from a young age. Did you come from a creative family or like where did, you know, where did some of the drive for that come from? Well, I suppose, I mean, I had, uh, I mean, my dad was uh, running a, a garage for cars, you know, fixing cars. So um, I wouldn't say that his, his talent was in music particularly, but um, uh, in fact, it wasn't at all. Um, my mom was, went to, did go to stage school when she was younger so there was a bit of that but uh, we just had very supportive parents who uh when i say we because i'm a twin so obviously jeremy and myself and i suppose that that's one of the things that we were always spurring each other on you know um so uh when they realized like at three years old that we were trying to play the piano that was in the house trying to get our hands up there and to actually play we were encouraged, you know, so that's really, or I mean, in a way, that's really what's needed when you're young is, is some encouragement rather than being told to stop, you know. Um, and that then led into, you know, at school, we were always trying to get up on the stage and do something. So, I mean, really, it's the same thing with all the things that, that I've done. Um, some of them I don't even remember why I did them or, you know, for what reason I was, you know, I was a dancer for a long time, um, but that was just part of growing up. And, and maybe it's because I was so bad at football, you know, <laughs> uh, or sports. I was never really, I mean, funnily enough, actually, I was, uh, I, I was always okay at playing football, but I used to, you know, foul people a lot, you know. But uh, Football, you're saying I, soccer, you mean, right? Soccer, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes no, I'm just yeah. translating. I'm going to I'm gonna be the translator. I couldn't really, I mean, I, I didn't mind playing it, but I was never, I, I just never was not interested in it, you know, so it never interested me. I was always interested in films or going to theatre or watching a band play. And when I first saw bands play, I just wanted, I, I was standing by the stage, you know, afterwards trying to get, to get on the stage and try the guitar or, you know, you know, so it was just natural, uh, I'm not saying I was a natural musician, but I was naturally uh, interested in it, and uh, my brother too. So um, obviously my brother became a drummer, and, and I I think we both started on guitar. Um, I think I had the upper hand on the guitar from my brother. And then one day a, a very bad small drum kit turned up, and within a few days I just could see that Jeremy was going to be a drummer. And I could see that I wasn't going to be, and I wasn't really that interested. So I stuck with the guitar. And so I said to my dad, you need to buy me an electric so I can keep up with the, the volume of the drums, which of course he agreed to straight away. <laughs> so your parents sound like they're really cool. They're really cool. Yeah. People. Uh, I mean, they just to say, they just, uh, they, I mean, some people would say they spoiled us. I, I'd like to sort of say, well, not, not really. We, if we earned, you know, if we earned it, if we looked like we were actually going to do something with it, then I'd get some more support. But I had to, we didn't just get stuff, you know, 
on a whim. They they knew that that was really all we were interested in. You know, so, what was that first guitar your dad bought you? The first guitar I got was it was a copy. The first guitar that I ever played in my life, electric guitar that I ever played, because I really only wanted to play electric. Was uh, I, I played a Gibson, uh, a, a black Gibson Les Paul Custom. That was the first guitar you played. That was the first guitar I played because I went up on stage after I saw a band play in a dance hall, you know, because we used to go to these caravan rallies at the weekend and uh, there would be like a dance at, on on the Saturday night, you know, and everybody would be drinking and there would be some some band doing top 40 hits, you know. But that was in the 70s, so it would be like, you know, The Sweet and, you know, some yeah. and some The Sweet, I haven't heard that in a long time. Yeah. So, so, so I so I'd get to get up on stage uh, on stage at the very end and see if I could talk the guitarist into letting me, you know. And I was just six, seven, eight years old, you know. So I think I, I, the first guitar I played was a was a Les Paul Gibson Les Paul Custom. So that's what I wanted, but I got a classical guitar instead, a three quarter size classical guitar, which I really wasn't that interested in, and. and I did actually go to a few classical guitar lessons, um, but I never got on with the with the uh, the teacher because he. I said the first thing I wanted to learn was Albatross <laughs> by Peter that Green. Was, yeah, that was all I wanted to learn. <laughs> the guy would teach it to me, and he said, "I'll teach it to you if you learn this tune, Green Sleeves." You know, it was a very basic version of Green Sleeves, and so I, I, le- I said, "Okay." So I learned it and went back the following week. And he still wouldn't teach me albatross. One so was, he was done, huh? <laughs> yeah. So I was. No, like, that's horrible, man. And then, uh, so I didn't really show any promise to him either because I wasn't, I wasn't interested in this process of, you know, if you do this, then I'll teach you something that you want to learn. Really, what I needed to do was just sit down and figure it out myself, which, of course, is what I started to do. Then after that, once you know the drum kit. Arrived. I think the joke it arrived just because it was just really, really bad. It was just a tom, like a high tom, a bass drum, and a snare drum, and a hi hat, and that was it. No floor tom, and it was like really some cheap Olympic premier type thing, you know, thirty quid, you know, kind of thing. So, um, so I think we got it. My dad had seen it and got it just to see what would happen. And I couldn't ever get on the drum kit. My brother would never let me on. He was just like playing it all the time. And then I suddenly figured out, uh, actually, I don't really want to play drums. Um, I want to play guitar, but I want I want a Les Paul. So I got he got me an Avon. It was called Avon Les Paul Copy Clone. It was like a Japanese. It was pretty bad guitar, very high action. But the fact that it looked like the first guitar that I ever played. I was so, I was made up, you know, so I was really happy about it. And um, so I played that for a little while. If you're interested in what I then got after that was I got a Strat, mm. which was a Kimbara Strat, which was by a Japanese company, a cheap Japanese Kimbara Strat, which was actually not a bad, it was not a bad guitar. It was pretty good. By the time I was maybe 11 or something, so... So then after I got that, then I was really, then I started to practice and I basically, I was doing pretty well. I think we both did pretty well at school to, up until that point And then I lost, completely lost interest in. Oh, any academic thing. Yeah, I didn't care. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't get any qualifications. Didn't care. Basically. What? Mom and dad were good with that? Didn't have any choice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just, it just, I don't think they, they could see there just was not something that I was, I mean, I still carried on. I just, I just didn't, I didn't, I wasn't interested in it anymore. I just wanted to, to learn music. Um, you know, learn how to play. one thing different about the UK and here. Yeah. Over here, I, I've got three kids, and believe me, my kids have done a lot of shit that I wouldn't have done. And a lot of times, parents say, "Well, how do you allow that to happen?" And then, like what you just said, like. What the fuck am I going to do? Chain them to the bed? I mean, yes. I, over there, you guys are a lot more like there's a term here, helicopter parents, where well, I, I'm not one of them, but there's a lot of that shit going on here. And so uh, my kids are older now, but I, I always like, you know, it, it, and I always notice that like, it, like my mother in law is never like the meddling type. She's like, oh, you know, whatever. And, um, 
and she's over there in the UK. And I don't know why people here are like that. Like, how do you let your kid do that? What the? F- <laughs> what do you? Well, you kind of learn this for producing as well as you, you can't actually, you know. Oh, as far as I, you can't change people. No. <laughs> well, you can maybe influence them, and then maybe over a period of a few years. I mean, it's like you know, like me, you know, I just sort of go. There's some things about me that I prefer, you know, wish I wasn't like, you know. Yeah. So I work on them, you know, slowly and yeah. hopefully a period of time uh, improve those things. But you know, you kind of it it, it takes a long time to change people. Uh, so and that and the thing is, is I, I was into schoolwork. I was I wasn't not. I'm, I'd say I was relatively bright, you know, but. Suddenly, it was not my interest. You yeah. know, I wasn't interested in maths. I was pretty good at maths, actually, but I was—I just wasn't really interested. I was interested in theatre, films, music, yeah. drama. You know, the arts. I was into the arts. I'm not um, drawing though. Terrible, yeah, yeah, terrible drawing. Dreadful. Well, man, you can only be good at four things. Don't you know that? <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. You and your brother were then founding members of the Lemon Trees, and you guys had some pretty good pop hits. But like, I don't, I don't think the band lasted long. If without like getting gossipy or anything, what anything particular happened there? Or, um, well, yeah, it was a, it was an interesting band because, I mean, I didn't, I, I was already sort of playing jazz by that time, and I was mm. hanging out in jazz clubs till the early hours of the morning. At the same time, so. Sort of, doing an acting I was like kind of had an acting career and that was really what I was thinking of doing and suddenly my brother said that he'd seen a band called World Party uh who are a, a great I mean a, I'd say slightly underrated band and um and that he'd met the, the guys from that band and then suddenly the, the the piano player from that band who was Guy Chambers um left or start, sort of starting his own thing, you know, wanted to do his own thing. Obviously, it wasn't called the Lemon Trees then. So basically, Jeremy become friends with him. So what happened is that Jeremy started playing on some demos with Guy, and then then I was sort of asked to go and play some guitar. And then before we knew it, we were Guy had written all these songs, and this was much more sort of. Um, I'd say 60s. It was still pretty pop. It didn't sound really very 60s, but it was much more beatly. Yeah, jangly. You know, jangly guitar type thing. Which I have to say, I, I, I was I was slightly confused because I, I I found it that it wasn't like something that I knew anymore because I'd been playing jazz, you know. So I was. I, it was quite hard to dumb down into this. It felt like I was dumbing down into playing, you know, just. E chords and A chords, and then I realised that that I really needed to kind of like get my grounding back into that kind yeah. of thing because I played in punk bands when I was younger and um, you know uh, rock bands, so that was my whole upbringing. And then suddenly I was getting into like heavy chords and playing standards, and that sort of almost disappeared for me. So yeah. So anyway, the lemon trees. I'm trying to answer the question without going on going into sort of long. Um, long sentences about nothing. Um, but yeah, the, the, the thing is with that was we then did one gig. We decided to do a gig at, uh, in London. Um, we had a, sort of pulled this band together and we're playing these songs that we'd sort of been working on as recordings, you know, that we're in demo stage. And that night we got signed by, by MCA. How right? nutty is that? Uh, and the reason why is because it was just one of those magical gigs where everything just seemed to fall into place. And um, so we did that. It was your first gig together. It's the first gig. We'd never played a gig. And we, so we got signed. And I'd say it was based on the strength of the, the guy, obviously, ended up being a big writer, you know, was working, you know, Robbie Williams and Angels and all that. He wrote that and everything. So he had that talent. We knew he was a talented songwriter. And, um, but what happened is also that the, the lead singer of the band was uh, the bass player from World Party. The night that we got signed, the next day he left the band. <laughs> <laughs> so we're already having some difficulties. And then we had to sort of see if we could keep the deal and um, find somebody else. 
And uh, that was a long process, finding somebody else. And we ended up with a, uh, an old friend of mine from, from Bournemouth um, who I'd grown up with. And we had, we had that for two years, but the tr- the tr- we did that for two years. We did one record and, and that with uh, in London, which Guy produced as such. You know, um, I'd say that Guy and I produced it, but we'll, that's uh, another whole story. Um, and then Jack Joseph Puig uh, mixed it in L.A., and so we got to meet Jack, and then we did a second record with Jack, uh, which was a completely different thing. I mean, it was much heavier and uh, darker and sort of less pop record. But I think it was a pretty cool record, and um, and we got dropped because I think MCA really wanted this sort of like smiley. Uh, they wanted to uh, continue into the first record. Yes, and of course our aces had just broken and Blur were around and Suede were around and everything. So we weren't, I mean, we needed to, we weren't a real band. Yeah. You know, we were a put together thing because we just suddenly come together as a group of musicians and a writer. So we were almost like, you know, like, um, uh, you know, I suppose. Menudo. Yeah. <laughs> So, so the kind of band was sort of like it was kind of flawed, and yet we could we could do it. You know what I mean? We That's got amazing though. Your first because we could actually really do it, but but there was something missing, and there was this whole commercial, you know, sort of thing that we had you know, because we weren't a real band. We just weren't a real band. I think we be, by the end of it, we just become a real band when we got dropped. Yeah. But funny enough, I mean, I still. I, I now still I actually work for guys sometimes you know I went and played on Robbie's records you know maybe a year ago um, because cool. the, because the money was good whoa <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, no but I like guy I mean I we, we've kind of you know sort of made up now and um, but that's what happened with the lemon trees we weren't a real band that's why I didn't really last yeah. we got dropped so, so it's like you didn't pay enough dues sort of. Yeah, it's just, it's just that all those other bands, you know, have been, you know, they started, you know, in little rehearsal rooms and they were building, they, they had a whole concept of what they, what they really were. Yeah, okay. We okay. just came together, we were just doing some demos, we did a gig and we were signed and suddenly we didn't even have a name. We didn't, oh. even, we didn't even have a real name. Um, uh, and so we had to find a name and I never wanted the Lemon Trees, I hated that name, I, I didn't want it. So, um, but I didn't have an alternative that anybody was going to like. So, um, so it, the lemon trees, it was. And then of course we had also, because MCA put, it was a lot of money okay, that we were signed for big money. I mean, for that, for that time, it wasn't, uh, I, I mean, they were getting, the budgets were getting lower, but it was still very good money for that time. And, um, and then we got people in, you know, with, doing covers for us, you know, album covers that I really hated. I hated the album covers. I hated the way we were being pushed, you know, uh, how we were being, um, sorry, I can't even string a sentence together at the moment. No, it sounds like you were being manufactured by all these people and having very little, you were like the, uh, exactly. you yeah, know, the was- cog in, you know, you were like the, you know, they wanted you to play the, like the monkeys almost. Actually, that, I mean that's that's it. Yeah. The, the monkeys is a good that's a, that's a good way of saying. It. Um, yeah, no, I don't I, mean I, monkeys. I mean like the band, the monkeys. Yeah, no, that's yeah, what I mean. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no I, I knew I knew exactly yeah, what you said. like yeah. manufactured and just yeah, you know. manufactured. Yeah, we 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 were manufactured, and they they put us across as manufactured. And um, I just you know I'd always been in bands, so this was the most unlike being in a band I'd ever been in. Yeah. And of course, it was uh, signed and doing, you know, started to do quite well. But yeah, so uh, I, I, I didn't, I didn't dig any of that stuff. But yeah. uh, anyway, uh, but I did, but I did rate Guy. I thought Guy was great, and uh, and I learned a lot. I actually learned a lot about playing, and also through meeting Jack Joseph Quig. That was really the precursor to me sort of getting back into recording because i'd always my brother and i got a porter studio by the time we were probably 17 so we were recording bands we had bands coming in and out of our little house you know we were doing these recordings for you know for three or four years and um i, I like recording but when we did uh the lemon trees uh i got to 
get an eight track you know machine and started doing demos and stuff and then that ended up with me p- having people around to record and before i knew it i was thinking um i probably should start thinking about producing but that took another three or four years to to really happen you know so. but that's realistic that usually it's like you know whenever things like that happen it's usually not like hmm you know i think people tend to think oh i'm i should this guy started producing and then he had like 40 clients next month that, you know, that usually, you know, things always take a long time to happen it, and oh, projects yeah. take, I mean, take, yeah. I don't know if I was necessarily qualified to do it. You know, it's just that when I worked, when I worked on the first lemon trees album, I was, I was doing a lot of comping, you know, messing around with comping and not that I think comping is necessarily great production. It's, it's a certain style of production. It's not something that I like to do so much now. It's more to do with, getting great takes live takes you know but um the second record i was sitting beside jack for like three months and um and you know i i after that that inspired me to sort of have a rethink about what i wanted to do that's good so, yeah. so you got something good out of that yeah definitely yeah so I'm going to talk about you've worked with a lot of cool people and um so i'm going to mention some names tell me how you first got the gig and if maybe a cool or interesting story about, about your experience. So let's start with Oasis. You, you, you went on a world tour with them. Yeah. I didn't play guitar for them. I played keyboards for them. Uh, actually, you know, after the lemon trees and then trying to get into production, I was, it was, it was tough. I had a kind of tough period where I thought I didn't know what, what I was going to do. And, and money was getting tight because the deal was over and, you know, and it was all sort of like, and I was acting a bit and didn't know whether, well, I've got too many things going on. I, I, I just don't know what to do. And, and production had suddenly become the, the focus. So, um, I had a couple, couple of years of rough years and then, um, I ended up meeting a guy who knew the Oasis slot. And to be honest with you, I wasn't, uh, a fan I wasn't like particularly a fan. I wasn't, uh, I didn't really listen to them. I was, I was actually more into Blur at the time, you know. Um, I did tell them that as well, which of course they thought was hilarious. But, um, <laughs> I uh, don't know why. <laughs> yeah. But what happened is that um, I got to know this guy who knew them, who was teching for Bonehead, the, the guitar player. And, uh, and he said, um, he called me one day and said, oh, do you know any keyboard players? And I said, yeah, I know loads. What do you want? He said, well, Oasis need a keyboard player because they're not going to use live strings anymore because they're too loud on the stage. And now the string players are now having to set up in a room in the back of the theater, you know, with a camera so that they can see what's going on. And they're just like recording them in there for the separation, but they're still not really coming across. So they want somebody to play it on a keyboard. Do you, do you know anybody who would do that? You know? And I went, no, not particularly, but let me have a think about it. So I thought about it for an hour. Um, it just so happens at that time, I was doing a little bit of documentary music for the BBC and I was playing a string pad with my, I had a Roland sampler with some quite good string sounds on. So I was doing that thinking who could do this and went, hang on a minute, I've got this kind of identity as being a guitar player, you know, why, why don't I do it? I could do with, you know, I could do with a job, you know, job that pays well. Yeah. With a, I could do with a tour around the world, you know. So I called him back after an hour and said, look, um, maybe I could do it. And he said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, great. Well, I'll put in a good word for you. I said, no, no, don't put in a good word. Just tell me where the audition is. He said, well, it's, it's actually tomorrow. There's, a, there's an audition tomorrow at 12 o'clock at uh, Music Bank. So I said, oh, okay. So I went, uh, I said, I'm going to, I'll, I'll do it. So I, I went along. And when I got there, in the middle of the stage, they had this huge room with the stage set up, with uh, everything set up. And there was a huge sort of keyboard rig with like 20 keyboards on the stage surrounding. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, good. oh no, oh no, I've, I've made a mistake, you know, because they're going to expect me to be able to understand all this stuff. They want they want a real keyboard player, you know, what am I going to do? So they want Rick, Rick Wakeman and... Uh... He bought a little Korg M1 <laughs> with a 
you know, the pitch wheel stick thing had broken off it, you know, and, and a Roland sampler that was in a Sainsbury's carrier bag. You know, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> and, Sainsbury's is a grocery store. Yeah, grocery store. Yeah, so I just, <laughs> you know, like I had that little That's- carrier bag. And I'd forgotten my lead as well for the, the to plug it in. I hadn't even got my IAC lead. And um, I had my MIDI cable. That was it. So I turned up looking like a, you know, like a tramp, really. Something. And, um, and suddenly Noel walked in and just went, you know, who the fuck is that? What the fuck's this on the stage? This Rick. This was when I was just thinking about leaving, you know. And uh, they went, oh, it's the keyboard player, you know, for the, the – the guy's auditioning and he looked around and he said, is this yours? And I was like, no. And he goes, Oh, well, where's, your, where's your rig? And I went, here it is. <laughs> you picked up your Sainsbury's bag. <laughs> and he goes, that's more like it. Go and set up. Oh, that was cool. So that must've made you feel like, well, that made me feel like, Oh, safe at least. Like, well, it, I, I sort of thought the last thing is they're going to want is somebody's flash. You know what I mean? So, so I, I just set it up got the sound and he started i mean he had like 400 watt marshals there and two leslie cabinets it was the loudest thing i've i mean it was loud i mean i've been in a few rehearsals of volume i went to a ufo rehearsal one day wow in, in uh when it was in nomis in london like back in the 80s and that was the loudest thing was that, I've ever that was uh after michael schenker had left it was after schenker yeah. it was a guy called mike mike i've forgotten Good guitar player, though. Mike. Uh, forgot his name. Anyway, he, he he had 400 watt marshals, and the bass player had like uh, four 200 watt marshals or whatever. I mean, it was literally like you know, just skin peeling off you kind of volume. It was unbearable, and in a tiny room. That was in a small room. I, I couldn't believe it. I never heard anything as loud. But this was about the same volume. It was, it was ridiculously loud. So Noah was playing. And I thought, well, there's no way he's going to hear me. And he had his back to me. He was just playing sort of like, I don't know, he was playing something in D minor. So, of course, I could hear it was a D minor. I could barely hear what I was playing through the monitor. And I just played D minor. And I think he went down to B flat. And so I went down to B flat. So I was just playing along with him. And he didn't look at me. He was just playing super loud. And then he put his guitar down after about six minutes, seven minutes. And he went, excuse me a minute. And he walked off into this side room. And they'd recorded it. So then he had to listen in there, what I'd done. You know, it wasn't even a proper jam or anything. He just wanted to listen to the strings. And he came out and he went, you'll do. You got the gig. <laughs> you'll do. You got the gig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's classic. So then, so then I went on tour with them for, you know, six months. And uh, during that time, they found out that I was a guitar player. And, um, yeah, I mean – to be honest with you, there's a story that goes on with that. It would take up the whole interview. But it was, uh, yeah, it was lots and lots of stages of them finding out that I'd acted in something or I was, you know, sort of, um, I was a guitar player and I'd been in this band and that band. And by the end of it, um, Noel decided to take my number and said, well, actually, we just, we got on, we got on very well, very, very, very soon into the tour. We sort of kind of hit it off. And um, so we basically hung out for the whole six months. And then uh, just at the end of the tour, he said, let me get your number. Because obviously it wasn't so big on mobile phones at that time. It's 97. Right, right. We were mobile phones, but we weren't like texting each other and doing all the stuff we do now. You, you weren't know. texting each other from one end of the bus to the other. <laughs> like it goes on now. It's your phone, just get hold of somebody at home. Yeah. But you wouldn't be phoning each other much on the tour because it would cost too much as well. Be like oh, that's right. Unbelievably expensive. No, I certainly wouldn't be calling him anyway. But uh, so at the end, he said, let me get your number. I said, because he said, you might be very useful to me. And I said, oh, right, okay. And I, I really thought that that was probably it and that maybe he'd call me for another tour later on. But sure enough, 10 days later, he called me up and he said, I'm going to Air Studios to do a film so I've got to do a song for a film. Do you want to come along and bring your, you know, bring your shit with you? You know, and I said, yeah. So I took some keyboards down. I took some guitars down, a couple of microphones I got and stuff. And I ended up doing the session. It was just me and him um, for the X-Files. Oh, wow. Um, and I played whatever he didn't want to play, which was most of it. 
I think I just did a couple of things. I might have played a bit of piano or something on it. And uh, I didn't play any guitars or anything that time. And then a week later, he called me and said, I'm doing some demos. Do you want to come and do it? And this ended up just going on and on and on for like two years. And that turned into standing on the, standing on the shoulder of giants, you know, records. That's so cool. Well, I basically just worked from then on. And since then, you know, on and off for 20 years, I've been doing many menial tasks for that guy. Well, but where, where were you the last three weeks? I was in Abbey Road with, with Noel, yeah. yeah. Doing, um, some new stuff, whatever that, and you never know where it's going to turn. It's usually sort of like, do you want to go in with Noel to do some demos? And I go, they won't be demos. They will end up on a record somewhere. And sure enough, the one track we've done, I know will probably end up somewhere. So very cool. Man. Yeah. So yeah, I've, I've, uh, yeah, it's been in, in fact, through Noel, that's how I got to, uh, meet the Black Rose. I mean, actually, hang with them and then getting asked to do some stuff with Chris and, and, and then, yeah. Oh, they, cause they, they, had, they were on the same bill or something. No, what had happened is that then I was basically, I was practically, I mean, I, two years went past. I probably saw Noel nearly every day for two years. You know, I was mm. either in the studio with him. I stayed at his house sometimes and then I stayed at his other house and I was sort of like being sort of like on permanent call most of the time, which was great. You know, yeah. And um, and then so we'd go to gigs as well. So we'd so wherever, wherever gigs he was going to, I'd go to. And so he said, "Oh, Black Crows are in tonight. Do you like them?" I said, "Yeah." So we went, and then we went backstage afterwards. Ah, uh, okay. And then I just um, I met Chris, and we just start, I mean I met the whole band. But as soon as I started talking to Chris Robinson, um, we hit it off. You know, we just and then he called. I think he called Noel maybe a few months later and said, we like, you know, we've just heard your record. We're interested in, uh, working with spike, the producer. And for some reason in this particular situation, Noel said, you need to work with, you know, uh, my nickname was strange boy by that time. So <laughs> you, need, you need to work with him. So, uh, so I got a call from Chris <laughs> classic Chris was, he called me from France and he said, what, uh, Hey, you remember us meeting? I said, yeah, of course. He said, what are you doing? And I said, uh, well, I'm sitting in my little, little bed set at the moment. <laughs> and he said, uh, I, I said, where are you? And he said, I'm in Paris. And I said, Oh, okay. With my new girlfriend. And I said, Oh, okay. And I said, um, he said, do you want to come to Paris? And I said, sure. And he said, when? And he went, now, of course. <laughs> I said, and you're not kidding, are you? He said, no. So I got straight on the train, and went straight to Paris, and went and hung out with him till the early hours. And, um, yeah, we had a fantastic time. And so you hung, you just hung as... I just hung as friends, and then he came to London straight after that. And... Um, how, let me, wait, let me ask you a question. It's a stupid question, man. You don't even have to answer it. But how do these things work? So you hang out with him in Paris and you're like, do you go stay in a hotel? Like, do you go like just hop back on the train? Like, how does that work? Or do you have, do you hang out for a few days? I mean, I know, I know uh, that's like no, silly I, questions. I think, <laughs> it's, um, it's again, every, every story I have like this was, has an incredibly long story to it, you know, cause I got on the train, went over there, found out, found out where he, Chris was with, uh, I just met Kate at the time, you know, Kate Hudson. So okay. we just, so I then went and hung with them in the hotel and then we went out to dinner. And then when I got back to the hotel, there was no rooms in the hotel. So I had to go and find the hotel. And obviously this isn't something that anybody, you know, but the thing is, is I'm, I've been traveled so much. I wasn't worried at all. You know, I was like, Hey, listen, you go to bed. I'm going to go walking. What I forgot that it was uh, a World Cup final thing that night. Oh, there was no hotel rooms. There anywhere. were no hotel rooms, and not only that, there were like fans from both teams wandering around the streets. Oh, drunk and rowdy. Some some rowdy, some not so rowdy. I'm sort of used to how to deal with that, so I just um, managed to avoid any uh, confrontations and. Um, Carried on walking around Paris during the night, and at about 
six o'clock after walking for a few hours and just hanging out and going to like if there was some place that was open i'd go and go inside and have a coffee or something there wasn't many places so so i was getting a bit cold i got to a I ended up at train station at six o'clock. I didn't know where I was walking, where I was going, and at six o'clock I ended up at the train station. I got straight on the train and came home. Oh my and when god! Day I walked so much I could barely walk. I was going to say you must have been shattered, man. I was shattered, but it, but then they called me. Uh, Chris called me and said, "We're coming to London now. We're following you back." So they came to London, and I had a gig that night, and so they came to the gig. Oh, cool! And then. Um, the next thing they 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 were sort of asking me to, to get involved with uh, Lions, the record they did, Lions, um, but the uh, Black Rose. But uh, for some reason, I think they just signed to Virgin, um, and Virgin didn't know who I was, so they didn't want a, an unknown producer. Sure. So uh, yeah, so Don Was did it, and you know, no offense, to Don, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But. Uh, I, so I didn't actually end up doing that record. Um, it's probably it's probably good actually in a way. It's probably better to wait a bit. But then Chris left the Black Crows about maybe a few months, not long, really after that. He left the Crows for a bit. Well, they went on hiatus, and uh, and he called me and said, "I'm going to France to make a record. You're coming with me." So I ended up making a, two solo records with him, and you know we we had a good 10 year period of making music and um, all I can say is what a guy, what a guy. Amazing. Amazing talent. Very cool. Very man. cool. Yeah. All right. You also did some work with Madonna. Yeah, actually, to be honest, I, I just, I just played on that record. Um, what's it called? Like a virgin. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> I'd lost my virginity by then, but, <laughs> <laughs> and I think she had to. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> no, I, I got to, because I just worked with Spike Stent on Standing on the Shoulder of Giants. I think the truth of the matter is, I think he was working on that record. Is it is it called Music? That record. I mean, I don't know much about Madonna's catalog. Uh, to be honest with you. Yeah to tell you i don't it's, it's a record where she has a cowboy hat on on the front it was a it was a big record i think for her. i think it is called music actually i think that's it and you did session work on there well what it was is that i think i think spike had called Noel and said will you come and play acoustic guitar on this track for, for madonna and i think Noel wasn't either wasn't available or he said no i don't actually know so yeah i can't remember I could find out, but I can't, I actually can't remember what happened. So then I got called by Spike and he said, what are you doing? It was one of those, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm sitting in my bed. Set. <laughs> come to Paris now. <laughs> no, he said, come to Olympic studios. Now bring your acoustic guitar. We need some acoustic guitar for Madonna. And I was like, Oh, okay. All right. So in the car, I get go to Olympic walk in, and, um, yeah, she's, um, she's was she there. there. Yeah, she was there. And it was a, track called gone and it was uh william orbit producing and and spike or spike mixing yeah maybe he was co-producing i can't remember but anyway they just played me the track and when she went um here's the version that i've just uh done with with william playing acoustic guitar and she said and now i want somebody to play it and she said i want you you know i want it to sound like a fucking human Nice. And I just went, oh, okay. I'll well, I'll try and do that then. <laughs> so, wow. She was pretty funny. She, um, I thought she was very funny. And everything went well. So that it, got- it took me half an hour. It was just a half an hour. Just while the five guys on the computers at the back were figuring out how to record it. Um, yeah, I um, I that just played it. guitar. And it's just it's just drum machine, acoustic guitar, and her voice. I think maybe with a pad or something. It's very very. It's the last track on the album called Gone, I think. Yeah, Gone. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that's really all. That's the only stuff I had with Madonna. But, of course, you know, you play on one track for Madonna and, and that goes in your credits. And yeah, that's... Credits. And a few people... I, yeah, it's just amazing, really. It's just, I just... It was a, a little day's work, you know. So. 
Well, at least you didn't have to go to Paris for it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that Paris trip earned me, you know, 10 years of... Yeah. Uh, somebody, yeah. With somebody that I, you know, wanted to really yeah. work with. But I, you know, I enjoyed that session. It was, it was fine. You know. And then you play with Uncle. So you is U N K L E. And um, for people who may not know this, this was like DJ Shadows. How would you describe their music? They're like they're not really hip hop. They're like DJs, but they have a lot of music in there. DJ, yes. Yeah, so- Sort of coming from the same place as the Chemical Brothers sort of thing, except, you know, I'd probably get killed for saying that and they go something. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not really up on that music, to be honest. It's, the reason that I get to do that is because um, uh, Noel and I were, I basically, I was in his studio in his house above, right at the very top of his house when he used to live in uh, Belsize Park. and um, Palisades Park? No, Bell size. Okay, sorry. Yeah, there's, so, a, no, it's not Palisades, yeah. there's a place in New Jersey yeah, like, called Palisades Park. I was oh, like, right? what? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like, oh, no, this was this was Bell Size Park. And um so yeah, I was I was working up there a lot on some stuff for him and so some remixes were coming in and I think they wanted Noel to be involved on it on, on a remix sort of thing. So yeah, I ended up working on that with Noel. Basically, again, at that particular time, whatever Noel was working on, I would sort of be involved with. So uh, I, uh, I, to be frank, I can't remember what I did. With I Uncle, yeah. was, but it was mainly getting some files over, and of course this was in the days where it was really hard to get files, formats, and all that stuff. So mm. it would be format. Is everything in time? Is everything placed properly? And then, you know, I had a, you know, an early, early version of Logic Audio, which barely worked, you know, at the time. You know, the audio part was like to get it in sync with the MIDI part was like, you know, hell, you know. Mm. But, um, yeah, so that's what I, that's what I did. I worked on that. And Noel would be working on it with me. Well, I mean, Noel was working on it. That was, it was what he wanted to do with it. And I would do all the donkey work. So if anybody wants to check out Uncle, what I would recommend, they have an album called Science Fiction, Science being spelled P-S-Y-E-N-C-E. And if you want to like listen to, and this is, I don't listen to a lot of this music. I really like this um, album though. Uh, they have a song, I don't know if you ever heard it called Rabbit in Your Pocket, I think it's called. Yeah, it's probably a, have- yeah, I probably heard it during the time. Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, as I say, uh, without sounding uh, without sounding rude, I didn't really listen to it much afterwards. No, no, no. It's, it's in the late nineties. It's called "Rabbit in Your Pocket," I think, by Uncle U N K L E. And then let's just talk about one more man. We can go on all night, but Chris Squire. Oh yeah, from Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, that just happened because I I was. Uh, I was in the studio. I, I was in the studio. Um, I had my my studio in in South London, and um, I would never really rent it out to anyone particularly. But for some reason, uh, a couple of guys had called me about renting the studio, and that, that were, were a band called The Sin. They were from a band called The Sin, which was the precursor to Yes. And I was a Yes fan. I liked Close to the Edge. I grew up with that record, and that was one of my favorite records, um, and still is. And, uh, so, and I was, loved Chris's playing obviously on that and, um, everybody's in fact, but the thing was, is that these, these guys wanted to come and do some work on old recordings that they had and maybe do some overdubs. So it was actually, um, uh, it's actually terrible that I've just forgotten the name. What, do you know what the name of the guitarist was from the sim or was it in no. the early Peter, he's called Peter. I just knew him as Peter, but uh, Peter, some people who are like fans of him will just be going, how do you not know his name? Well, he was in the studio with me, Peter. Uh, Peter Sandorf? Peter. No. Peter, Peter Banks? Peter Banks, that's it, Peter Banks. Mm. Yes, that's it. Peter Banks was the guitarist 
who was in yeah he was in yes in the early yes but he was in the sin so peter banks it's s-y-n there. for everybody for everybody s-y-n yeah um so he, yeah he was in that band and then there was a guy called jared johnson who was also producing and mixing and then steve nardelli who was a singer from the sin was there uh, but they they wanted to come to my studio, hire my studio to do the stuff. And at that particular time, I was just about to go on tour with the with the Finn brothers. So I was with them for a while just to see what they were going to be like and whether it was going to be cool. And what I did is when I went away, my assistant kind of opened up the studio and let them record there because there was nothing for me to do. So it was really one of the first times I'd let my studio out to people to, to hire. Um, and they were cool. They were all old guys, cool. You know, the guy who was the producer used to work at Aranoco Studios. I, I knew that he was a totally trustworthy guy, so and he was into all the stuff I had there. So I just let him use the place. Um, sorry, to get to the bit, the Chris Squire bit of the story. So while I'm gone on tour with the, with the Finns, I get a call from my assistant to say that Chris Squire has also – it's also been in touch with the sim because he used to be in that band. And he came to the studio one day and saw that you have a Chris Squire, Rickenbacker face, the, the reissues, you know, one, which I did. I bought one, um, one of those. And, uh, like just, I just like that face. I didn't really want, I don't really like buying guitars with people's names on it, but it just happened to be a really good bass. Hmm. Anyway, he said, could he borrow it for a photo shoot? And I said, Chris, of course. Yeah. So he borrowed it for a photo shoot. And then I think he came back and actually did a little bit of bass while I was away. And then they knew my production stuff that I was doing. So suddenly they're asking me, would I be interested in doing some producing with Gerard as well involved and doing a sin record, you know, and I sort of was like, uh, is Chris Squire going to be on it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> really, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to do it, uh, I suppose I wanted to maybe see how Chris was, you know, so we, we met, uh, me and Chris met and, you know, after a little bit of talking and, you know, sort of slight reserved, you know, judgment on each other, we, I, we could see that we were probably going to get on. So, yeah, so I ended up doing a record with him and then ended up actually, you know, he was one of my dear friends and very sad that he's no longer around. Uh, really miss him. One of my, really one of the most, one of the most funny people I've ever met and a, and a, re, and a real talent, you know, incredible talent. Um, in fact, um, Chris Robinson and I had a, a night because Chris was also a huge fan of, of Chris Squire. Uh, yeah, of Chris Squire. Well, of yes, you know. And um, and one day Chris came over to was in London. And he said, "Is there any chance we can go and hang with Chris Squire?" And I said, "Sure." So I called Chris. He's going, "Yeah, I'd love to meet Chris Robinson." So we went and had a night um, over at Chris's house, and um, yeah, that was just amazing. That's amazing. cool, man. Yeah. I have another story, which I'll tell you another time about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we're just going to talk about stories of um, the, some of them I can't even repeat. So. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, talk about your acting gigs, Paul. How'd you, how'd you like get, you got, you know, you didn't have massive roles, but they were roles in major movies. So what was that experience like? You know, how did you get the gig and any cool or interesting stories? Sure. Yeah. Um, and was your brother an actor too, or I just started, you? I, I started doing this acting like when I, when I was very young, and um, it was almost like again another sort of thing. You kind of you have an identity that I go around saying I'm an actor, you know. And sort of like at the end of the day, I sort of like I don't really know what I am anymore. I'm just interested in all these things. So acting doesn't that something. suck, man? That you? What do you mean? Oh, I mean, like um, I think. We, I don't. I think I've gotten trapped into things like that. You have an interest in it. You say, "Well, when can I say Did I'm a- that I'm a blank?" Like I remember when my my Anne, my wife, she always ran the back ends of all my businesses before I met. When we first got married, before we had kids, our our, our last child, anyway, she was really successful business. She ran uh, 
she was VP of operations of a national service company. They had like 110 people reporting to her. So she knows work and business and stuff. So, but about five years ago, she said, you know, I'd like to become a realtor. And then I remember having like, when can I say I'm a realtor? Like how many houses do I need to sell? <laughs> you know, well, it, it's always that the internal I, dialogue with ourselves. Like when do we, when, when do we self-qualify, you know? Well, that's, yeah, I think it's uh, actually, it's really when other people tell you, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, I was mixing, started mixing records in, you know, maybe 2000. I think that's the first time I actually mixed a record, like mixed it myself without, with a little bit of help from a friend, you know, sure. that was more qualified than me. Um, but I knew I was, I knew I, I couldn't really call myself a mix engineer then, you know. But I but I'd done a lot of tracking by then, so I was almost sort of going, you know, I think I can say that I'm a tracking engineer now, but mix engineer no. And I I could see that it was I think it's like anything, you know, the ten thousand hour thing is is true. You know, it's, it's definitely true. You you just have to put in a certain amount of hours, and then suddenly something something happens where it's you're not worrying about the technique anymore, whether you're you're actually doing the job right. You suddenly start to actually um, express yourself in what you do. Mm. I think that's when you you know that you can feel it. And suddenly you, you, there's an expression that happens where you're actually doing something that's truly yours. You know, truly yeah. what what you can do is your full potential, if you like. You know, yeah. um, and that's really. Uh, it took me a long time to feel like that about mixing. I must. Admit. I think mixing is one of the. So, I mean, maybe some people say it's the easiest thing, or I don't really care what they, other people say about anything, actually. But mixing for me took a long time, but now I definitely know that I can express. I, I, I feel totally comfortable about mixing. I can sit in most places. Give me the track you want me to mix. If you want me to make it sound like, you know, this and this and this, I don't do that. If you want me to do my interpretation of this mix, I can absolutely do that, Even, you know, unless the recording is so bad, you know. Um, but but, but uh, sorry, wait, you were saying about um, so I got off the subject of the actual subject. Yeah, was, the, uh, acting no, it's good. Your acting gigs. Yeah, um, acting how'd gigs, you get so, the roles? Yeah, um, what was the experience like? Well, the you know I got an agent obviously when I'd left drama school, uh, and I. Was doing. I did the National Theatre. I did, you know, I did Shakespeare in America. You know, did you? Did, yeah. So I, I where did. Where did you do Shakespeare here? Where did they do it? Yeah. Off, off Broadway place. But it was the National Theatre did a tour of, of um, Macbeth, which I'm allowed to say when I'm not backstage. What do you mean? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's bad luck to say Macbeth backstage. If you say it, it's really, it is, I mean, it's an old. old oh, I didn't know that. You never, ever say that play backstage because that means some terrible things will happen oh, obviously wow. and whether you're superstitious or not um but you're just it's best just not to say it because if somebody is superstitious then you've you've destroyed the you know it's a really bad thing to do. just so for that play or for any the name of any play that, that play the Macbeth. really it's, okay it's called the, everybody says the scottish play that's all they say interesting so, um, so I did that play, and we, uh, I got the gig for that play, and I, we went to, we went to Chicago first, and uh, Detroit, and Minneapolis, St. Paul, and, and it was my first time in the states, which is pretty incredible. To it, twenty six was the first time to be to, to actually see the states. Yeah, so, it's cool, and it was cool because I really wanted to go there, and um, and we ended up in New York, and we did two weeks. It was a twelve week tour. Of, and and we had to teach as well. So it's busy. It was another classic where I'm 26 years old and I'm going. How can I teach Shakespeare to anyone? I'm I'm 26. So I'm not. You know, if I'm 40 years old and I've done it for years and years, then yeah, I'm going to have something to teach. But the, I did have some things to say about it. But I I just thought I, I don't know what to teach. <laughs> anyway, so I did that. I did uh, I did a few theatre things, and then I started doing. TV things and film things. There's there's plenty of other stuff, but I just not so you must have been good at it if you got all these opportunities. I think some people thought I was good at it. I think I was, I think I was good at it. I, same same with music. If the material resonates with me, then I've got a chance. If the material is just if it's just 
bad writing or you know uh, a, a concept in play that I don't really agree with, you know, politically or yeah. religiously or whatever, then I have a really hard time. I, in fact, I would say that, I, and I'm the same with music. If I don't like the music, or I don't have a relationship with the music that I feel that I can contribute to, then I'm truly, truly screwed. You know, I, I literally become like somebody who can't act or can't play because I have nothing to say, nothing to invest in it. Yeah, which is not a very good session guitar player. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I totally. Yeah, yeah, right. It's not a good session guitar player. <laughs> I'm not a good session guitar player. I mean, I I can do it unless the music resonates with you. Well, the thing is, I think yeah. When I, I when I was working in the 70s and 80s as a session guitarist, which I I was, I did resonate with a lot more of the music then. So I thought I was a pretty good session guitar player. But now I'm, I I can do certain music that I like. If I don't like the music, I'm um, I'm in trouble. No, yeah. because I just want to leave. Actually, I just I just don't want to do it. Um, but anyway, uh, so yes, so four weddings and funeral. I got a call from my agent, and she said, um, "There's a f-, and I'd had I'd just been having some difficulties with my agent, saying, look, I don't want you to put me up for music jobs. I don't." You know, the whole reason I went to learn to act is because I didn't. It's it's about it's about your imagination. You know, you want to play a doctor, or you want to play. You, know, <laughs> you don't want to play a musician. <laughs> you want to play, you know, a, you know. That's why you want to play a gangster or something. So I'm not one of you know, those, so I can use my imagination and I can actually invent something. But if I'm going to play a musician, usually the writing for musicians is so bad. So, the words are so terrible. Yeah, the dialogue's the, not good. Like, it doesn't sound like music guys talking and they're trying to make them sound cool or, or you know, I'm not saying that musicians necessarily sound cool, but you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. the, there's a, there's a sort of music language and these, um, you know, th- th- these scripts are usually terrible. So I said to her, I don't want any more music gigs, please. And she, so she called me and said, I'm sorry, there's a film and they want you to sing a song in it. And I said, well, I told you, I don't want to do it. And she said, I want you to reconsider. So, and I said, I really, really don't want to do it. And she said, please look at the script and reconsider. So, uh, thanks to her, you know, she, uh, she did sort of talk me into it. So I, I got the script. I looked and obviously the first six pages is just fuck, 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 fuck. This is how the film starts. And then I looked at the cast list and I'm thinking, oh, well, it's some of the people from Black Adder, you know, which is obviously, Terrific writing, and um, obviously Rowan Atkinson is already, I think he's already in the cast, and um, Andy McDowell's there. Obviously, Hugh Grant wasn't, to me, I didn't know, I didn't really know his, his work. Mm. And, uh, so he wasn't so, so much of a household name then. But I also saw some other act- actors like Simon Callow and stuff like that. So these were all theatre actors, and I was thinking, wow, that is quite a formidable cast of theatre actors there and um it's chris and scott thomas as well and and a couple of people that i actually knew so i was like okay let me look at what i'm going to sing and it was at that time it was um annie's song the song that was supposedly didn't tell us anything about the character of what we were it just said to a, a boy and a girl singing annie's song at the from annie's song from the yeah, john denver you fell up my Yeah, it's John Denver. Yeah, he originally is. Yeah. So I, I knew that song. And so they required that I play guitar, with the acoustic guitar, and sing the song with with a girl. And that's it. So I'm like, okay. So I looked at the script and I kind of went, you know, oh, okay then, you know. <laughs> so I said, all right, I'll do it. And uh, we didn't, I didn't have to audition or anything. So... I got picked up at six in the morning on the day of the shoot. And the first thing we do is they pick me up. I think I was, can't remember where I was in London, but I think I was in Putney. And then they went straight across to Earl's Court and picked up Hugh Grant. So Hugh Grant's, <laughs> in, the car, so Hugh Grant's in the car with me. And then some, somebody else is picked up. Do you guys, are you guys talking at 7 a.m. with each other? Or? I just sort of go, hello. And he's like, hello. And I go, Paul. And he said, what are you doing today? And I go, I'm playing that song at the wedding. He goes, oh, jolly good. 
<laughs> you know, it. it's like it's too early in the morning for us to be kind of nice. That's like a know, very so. British conversation. <laughs> it's sort of like a Mercedes driving us, you know, to this out to the country for an hour. So yeah. we were in a, you know, we just we didn't really say much. We just kind of sitting there, sort of like kind of snoozing. And yeah. um, the, oh, and the, the guy in the front was the guy, the uh, the brother, the brother, like the deaf brother of you, you know, uh, the guy, his, his brother. His, I don't know. I, I don't. I, didn't, I don't. I like, saw the movie like briefly. I, sorry, I mean this is a film that I barely watched. By the way, I just remembered this now. I just remember that he was in the car too. So anyway, we were all driven off to to uh, somewhere. I think it was like near Aylesbury or something like that in farm farmland. And where is that in England? North, south, north of London, south, uh, uh, west, sort of near, sort of, it, sort of above, just above Oxford or something. I think that's where we were. We might have even been near. Chalfont St. Giles or something. I can't remember. It was, but it was it was an hour's drive away or so mm. uh, at six in the morning. So we arrive on set sort of like 10 to 7. And I'm walking around and I'm sort of like, we've got all these little caravans, you know. Where, so we're in there and I meet the girl that I'm working with who is now a famous actress in, in England, uh, Nicola Walker. And uh, it's a famous TV actress uh, anyway, as far as I know. Sorry if it's TV or films. I don't know what, how famous she is, but she's She's doing very well, isn't it? and uh, she was just, you know, twenty years old, twenty, twenty-one, wow. and I'm like uh, uh, 30, 32, 31, 32. So anyway, we meet, we say hello, we have a coffee, we sit down, we start playing any song. Next minute, Richard Curtis walks in. This Richard Curtis is the um, writer, and obviously he directed Love Actually and all those things. But I didn't know who he was. He says, hi, hi, I'm Richard. Hello. Uh, look, we've got a bit of a problem. It's, uh, I know it says Annie's song, but, you know, John Denver wants 10, this is obviously before he died, obviously, he wants 10,000 10, pounds for the usage of this song. And we can't afford to do that with the budget on this film. So we've gone with a different song. Is that okay? And I said, okay, what is it? And he was like, it's Barry Manilow can't smile without you and i was like oh okay so but how so, much so barry didn't want 10 grand he wanted less money yeah, he went three <laughs> this wow. is what i this, this is what i remember on this the is day. hilarious three grand okay okay you know what though 10 grand is cheap because well, I, I, I was I, just i mean i i i mean you know it's england it's cheap anyway it's like it's a working title well sorry i don't have a working title this i think working title done pretty well actually since that film, for sure. But um, it, this was all cheap, cheap, cheap. Everything was cheap, cheap, cheap. And also, we had, uh, you know, there was a star on the film, you know, Andy McDowell. Yeah. And, I mean, she was she was getting paid serious, serious money. Mm. She was the only one. She had she had the, the crown jewels. Oh, she, she got that, yeah. She had the Winnebago. We all had these little caravans. Everyone, you know, it's terrible. Typical English, you know, getting... Nothing. <laughs> she had the big Hollywood, you know. Well, Matt uh, told me. I think it was Matt or or um, Adam. I think it was Adam because he does a lot of licensing. Adam Adam Goldsmith, and when he said, um, I said, because he, he's was that? It's a dear old Adam. Yes, he's doing all this American movies. I'm like, why are you doing tracks for American movies? He goes, because it's so much cheaper here. English, yeah. He said they bring it over here because our our union or our scale is so much lower. That's right. And I was like, "Wow, that's yes." Well, my- maybe for him, but not for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm not anything cheap anymore? Good Sorry, for you. Just, uh, no, he's um, he's going by union rates. I'm sure that you know. Yes, he, no, he, you no, know, he no, gets no, paid what he gets paid by the union. You know, whatever the scale is. Yeah. I mean, I know there's things like there's. Uh, I think it's I think it's still pretty good, but it's but yes, it's, probably, it's, it's much pretty, less than here in the states. Yeah. Apparently, that's yeah. why they bring all the tracks over there. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So I, so that's um, so you had a scene can't I'll smile tell, without yeah, you. Tell the story. I got on set, and you know, and we had to learn can't smile without you. And uh, I have to tell you, it was one of the hardest things. You know, what seems like a scene that's easy to do, just get up there and say. It's because we had no characters. We didn't even know what we were. Oh, we so you had no context to operate in. We had no context to operate. So we're singing this song, and of course, there's, there's Barry Manilow 
um, on cassette. They gave me a cassette player and a cassette of Can't Smile Without You so that I could quickly learn it. Yeah. I mean, so I sort of knew it anyway, but I, I mean, I, I could have done it, done it, but I, I listened to the cassette. So we're listening to Barry sing it, which is Can't Smile Without You, an American accent. So we're both singing it. We're mimicking that because we just learned it. We got oh, you're that. mimicking the American accent. And the thing is, is it just sounded so bad because we didn't know who we were, you know. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is that, you know, I mean, I was doing method acting, so I was trying to find a sort of unlocking device yeah. so that yeah. I didn't have to act, you know. I just didn't want to sit to it. And both me and, and uh, um, Nicola were sit- sitting there going, oh, you know, this is so eggy. This is so awful. You know, like we're we're going to be so bad in this film. You know, why did we agree to this? And Richard Curtis was trying to help us along, and sort of going, "Yeah, can we kind of make this more funny?" And we're going, uh, "Don't know." <laughs> it's like we don't yeah, know. You have no context for anything. Like, yeah, we like shooting this at ten o'clock. You know, we haven't even got costumes on yet. So anyway, he left the the the, um, the caravan, and we're just like sitting there going oh, head in hands like oh no this is going to be so terrible edgy you know so we're sitting there talking and funny enough I say it's just these, these things you remember suddenly my acting teacher was a guy called Christopher Fettis he taught Anthony Hopkins you know oh wow and and, and he was like a formidable person a uh, formidable character uh, uh, anyway uh, I mean actually he's still alive he's still around but, you know, when I saw Hannibal Lecter with Anthony Hopkins, I knew that Anthony Hopkins was doing Christopher Fettis. That's what he was like. As oh, person, really? Really charismatic, sort of eye-staring kind of like incredible guy. Um, and Christopher always said to me, he said, you know, uh, you've got to unlock the scene with something real. You've got to, you've got to have something real to to think about when you're singing, when you're, when you're acting, when you're, I was just racking my brains, and somebody had always said, uh, he'd always said, you know, he said, just go back to the words as well. What are you actually saying? You know, and I was going, can't smile without you, can't laugh, can't sing, finding it hard to do it. And I went, Nick I said, we're singing to God. We're Christians singing to God. And we both kind of went, suddenly we didn't have to act it. So you got into a state that you were able to just be genuine. It's just like we're doing, we don't have to worry about who we're singing to, you know, in this. Right, right. Like, or who we're related to in the church, you know, because we're trying to work out who, who, why are we here at this wedding? We don't know. So we became the, um, the frightful folk duo. That's when they heard us sing this song. That's why they called us the frightful. And of course, we went into the uh, wardrobe, you know, to, to get our gear on. And so, of course, I went for a kind of like slightly white sort of suit, you know, kind of thing, sort of like hippie. We went suddenly we had characters, you know, we yeah. could do the hippie sort of John and Yoko thing, you know what I mean? So it was cool, man. So in yeah. the end, were you happy with, with the performance you did? Well, the thing is, is that I didn't even think about it when I was doing it. That was what I was in when I was doing it. So that's all I was thinking about was, you know, singing to the Lord. Singing to the know, Lord, yeah, these, yeah. With these words, and because the words completely translated to that so suddenly i didn't have to worry about being funny or anything in fact the last thing that i was trying to be was funny and of course after that i got auditions um for you know people coming and say can you do that funny thing you did you know in four weddings and i'm going yeah that took about an hour of work and like sifting through ideas and that of how to unlock the scene so that we can this is probably a hard question what would you say the top three experiences you've had musically for any reason, the, the work you did or the personalities involved or that particular hang was good or just a great moment. Wow. Uh, okay. Um, top three. Well, I mean, so you're saying a particular event or a job. Either, you know, just the three experiences that, you know, you've had a long career doing this, so it's a tough question. So, you know, it could be just playing on stage with your brother because of the, you know, the feeling that you first had, you know? Yeah, there's, I mean, there was one, there was one that was just, had a kind of like magic moment for us. It was definitely was, uh, I, I did uh, Letterman with Tom Jones. Oh. And um, I remember 
we we'd gone to America. Uh, we'd gone to New York to to do a few TV shows, but that was with the whole band. But there was this one track that we did called "Burning Hell" from that uh, from the uh, Praise and Blame record, and that was um, just a three piece. So that was just Tom and a guitar and drums, you know, and my twin brother on drums. And I think, you know, just because uh, my brother and I are sort of known in different, you know, all sorts of different ways, you know, my brother played with Cheryl Crow and, and, uh, and I played with the Black Crows, you know, but we both done Chris Robinson's band. We both did the Finn brothers. This is like the first time we played together for a while. And, um, all I had to do was it was just basically a kind of a rhythm thing. You know, there's nothing, nothing about it. But I think some people thought it was like Tom was trying to be like the White Stripes or something like that. You know, so no bass and no, yeah, just, just guitar and drum. But um, that was how it was on the record. And obviously Ethan Johns produced and played guitar on that record. And, um, and I was depping for, for Ethan because he wasn't around for a bit. Um, when you say depping, you mean subbing? Why do they? What is depping? Why do they call it depping? That's that's what we call it over here. Yeah, depping. I never heard of that. Depping is the right term to use. I think. Okay, depping. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, we did that, and I remember, you know, I got to, I'd done Letterman with uh, Oasis anyway. A couple, uh, I'd, I'd done Letterman maybe once, twice. I can't remember, but this was another time. So I knew it was going to we're going to get in there and it was going to be cold, you know, because it's freezing cold here. Everybody so tells me it's ice cold on there. Ice cold on stage, you know. And then about we got to rehearsal, and I just had my this little mini sort of Les Paul Junior type guitar, but it's got Firebird pickups on. Five hundred dollar guitar, cost me five six hundred dollars or something. Bought it at Thirty Street Guitars from Matt, you know, and uh, and it was like. Um, just great sounding, like really, it's just a cool sounding guitar. Sounds good through most amps. So I thought this is the perfect guitar for that song. And I went there, and they had uh, they got a deluxe reverb for me. Oh, cool! And into it, and it didn't sound too good. It was not a good sounding one. And I, you know, I thought I don't want to make. You know, when you don't want to make a scene, but I kind of went, sorry, somebody's going to have to get me another amp. You know, so being all sort of like. Prima Donnerish, and um, you're in New York. No one's going to bat an eye. Yeah, yeah. Then the summer goes. Well, we we have to go to the higher back to the higher company. And then I think it was one of the, the guitar guys. Uh, one of the guys playing guitar on the show said, "Well, they've got a basement at the back. They've got a reissue basement from the '90s at the back." So I was like, "Oh, let me try that." Reissue basement comes in. I turn it up to three. You know, two and a half, three. Plug the guitar in. There it is. There's the sound. That's, That's cool. It. And I'm kind of like, phew. Um, and so then we went upstairs, and then, you know, we're waiting, and then we, it's time, you know, we're, we're going to go, oh, we're going to go and do the show. And it, it just, um, I just didn't think about it. We've been doing some shows and stuff, and we've been doing some TV things. And then Jerry and I suddenly looked at each other and just went, this goes out to quite a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. You know, you just have that 20 minutes beforehand moment. And I remember sticking my head out the door and Tom was in the next dressing room and he stuck his head out at exactly the same, same time. And I looked at him and he went, fuck me. It's live. <laughs> and I was like, and I went, yeah. So, so it was quite good to hear him say that he, he was feeling it as well. Yeah. So we just, you know, went on and he looked at us and just went, come on, it's, Let's do it. Let's really do it. And so we did, and we finished that show. We finished that show, and um, and I remember thinking that was that felt like something, you know, felt good, you know. Just well, nobody did anything. It wasn't any flash or anything. We just it just felt really good, you know. And then Jeremy and I were walking back to the hotel, we were walking down Broadway and stuff, and. Uh, and I start getting calls, you know. Doyle Bramwell calls me, and Chris Robinson calls me, and then uh, Wayne Krantz calls me. Wow. Know? Yeah. I ended up playing on Wayne's records. I played on a Wayne Krantz record not long after that. Because, and, he, and I said, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to play Slide. <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> I'm not really, and I'm, I mean, I'm so not Slide player, you know. Um, so, uh 
that was funny. That was funny. But that that was well, number one. That's one of my highlights. Uh, I just remember that being a highlight moment in the kind of selfish way of like feeling kind of good, like I didn't really do anything, but it, it just had a good feeling about the whole thing. And you must it, like playing with your brother, though. I mean, I would imagine you guys. Yeah, well, it's I mean, kind of a special thing. There was something. I mean, obviously, I, I don't know whether we notice it particularly because, but I have heard people say that there is a special thing that happens. And all I have, all I can say to you is, yeah, I suppose so. I don't. I, it's hard to say. Well, it's it has very, to be. You guys have literally grown up together. It's very normal for us, and we both give the, give each other, you know, pretty hard time. Like, so you're slowing down there. It's like. Oh, you're okay. both like so. De- oh, you're both so as demanding as the other one. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I mean, and in a way, that's. I mean, we still talk about music like we did when we were young, and there is a never-ending. This isn't good enough about you know what we do, or this should be better. How are we going to do it? You know, is there a way of making it better? You know, it's it's always been the same you know, till we die. Very cool, man. Yeah. No, number two. Yeah. Or, I wish I wish I was better. I really, really do. But you need time. You know, I need to do it. The trouble is, is trying to is finding places to gig, to actually play more. You know, it's getting harder these days. There used to be clubs that I used to go to, and you can go to Ronnie Scott's late at night and sit in there or do something. But you know, I definitely like to. You, it's important to play every day. I think, you know, and and actually play live as much as you can. As often as you can. You know. How far do you live from Ronnie Scott's? Uh, well, right at this moment, depending on where I am, um, it's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's half an hour. Oh, that's know. it? Okay. Not, not Ronnie Scott, is it a small place? Cause, okay, I'm sure there's lots of places in America that are glamorized, like the perception here of Ronnie Scott's is, wow, this is this exclusive club, but I'm sure it's just like a regular club, right? Well, yeah, I suppose maybe it was a little bit more in the early days, but it's um, you still have to, you can't just walk in. You have to have a ticket, or you have to be supposedly in the MU or something like that, or you have to be a guest of someone. You can't just walk up the street and go in. Oh, to, even as a, a you mean as a musician or as a pay, a customer? Oh, if you're a musician that plays there and they know you, then you can you know then you can walk in. You know they'll let you in. The staff are very nice about that. But there's an upstairs bit for for Ronnie Scott's, which anybody can. That's more like a club, drinking club kind of thing. Right. But actual with the main stage where the the events happen, you have to have tickets, or sure. you have to be on the guest list, or a musician. Yeah. Oh, you can't when, pay for tickets at the door there. You can. You can if it's not. So, yeah. Sorry. If it's, it's not sold out. Okay. If it's not sold out. But okay, I get you. Two of people. Yeah. Yeah. I get you. That but, Jeff Beck show from there is pretty yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. No, that was. I was there. I was there for three nights. Oh, um, when so I saw, I saw most uh, most of what was on the video. I think it was the it was there on most of those nights. Uh, that was a great show. I actually sat next to Eric Clapton on the, the first. You sat seven. next to Clapton. Yeah. Do you know him? Like, did you guys? I didn't know him then. I've met him. Uh, he, he he came to my studio. Well, actually, Jeff came to the studio. Jeff Beck, I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, Eric, yeah, came to the studio. But for another, on another occasion, um, when I was mixing a, a record for Kurt Rosenwinkel, if, if you know who he is. Uh, Jazz guy. Guitar player. Uh, yeah. Um, I mixed this record for him a couple of years ago, and uh, Eric is a big fan. Obviously, Eric had uh, Kurt on the crossroads show and um so yeah eric came to the studio and hung out for a couple of hours that's cool did you ask him any questions that were interesting uh yeah i, I said yes i think i did ask him because cause i actually had a, a 54 les paul there that was um I, I got a 54 les paul that's actually uh cherry you know like it's being refinished from gold it's the only reason I could afford it. I was going to say, yeah, that drops. Gold, well, also, I just wouldn't pay that kind of money for I'm sorry. I would, there's only a certain price I'd go to. Maybe I'm just a bit cheap. But uh, No, it's it's I, out of control. I mean, they... they so out of control. And yeah. This guitar was a... 
you know, it had the original P90s, but it had been refinished, but it had been refinished in the 60s. So it actually looks like the, um, what do they call it? That The one that George Harrison uh, had from Clapton. You know that cherry? That, uh, that color, that color. Yes. And, and I bought it. I'd been looking for some a Les Paul for that color because I really have, a, you know, I have an issue with having one that looks like, you know, Peter Green, Jimmy Page, blah, blah. You yeah. know, that that sunburst color is just like everybody's got one. I mean, I have one, but I, but I don't have a 58 or a 59. I have a, you know, a, another one, a reissue kind of thing. And, um, so I was looking for a real Les Paul with um, but that color, and I bought this one. It's a 54. And um, so I, it was just out because I hadn't had it long. So when Eric walked in, he went, oh, what's that? You know, and I just went, uh, oh, that's, um, you know, he said, that looks like the one that I gave George. And I said, yeah. Um, and he said, that's the one that I played on my guitar, Gently Weeps. And I went, and I said, uh, actually, can I, can I ask you a question about that, that solo, that playing on that song? And he said, yeah. I said, I said what? I think I mean the, it's very very easy just to go and play guitar somewhere, you know, obviously. But what made you think? You know, did, was there anything that made you think of how to play that? You know, because it wasn't. I remember it wasn't a straightforward situation. He said, "No, no, no." So we got in there. Not sure whether the other guys wanted to be there. You know, George had brought me down. Blah 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 to play on this song. And I handed me the Les Paul that he'd given me and said, "You're playing that." And he said, and so I said, well, so what did you think? And he said, I just thought, what would, what would Buddy Guy do? Or what would, you know, Otis Rush do? And I kind of went, oh, okay. Yeah, that makes, that makes total sense, actually. You know, That's real play- cool. Yeah, so that was, that was very, very, uh, yeah, very, I would say like a very nice guy, but very interesting talkative and very you know deeply interested in the music mm. so and process and all that stuff and i mean just like you know just like you <laughs> just like yeah, yeah it's just a regular <laughs> how all this stuff ticks and it was it was yeah so it's great to, uh, you know uh hear what he had to say that's a cool story man yeah where, where do you, in and this might be an ignorant american question uh, it won't be my first though. Um, in, do you buy most guitars there, like like a used guitar like that at a at a store or for, like on a guy like Craigslist something? Like where do you where do you? Find no, it? I mean the thing is, I I have to play a guitar, um, and even though it sounds, it's not always the case. But just ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the case that I have to play the guitar. Oh yeah, sure. And I have a. You know, some people just buy can buy them off, you know. Oh, online and stuff. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how yeah. you do that. I, just, I can pick up one, pick up another, and it's just suddenly go, and yes, you know. Uh, but this this one, uh, I just walked into a shop. It's actually a place called Charlie Charlie Chandler Experience Guitars, <laughs> and uh, there was a there was a big uh, like Chaz Chandler. Like well, that's the Chandler is the name. Yeah, yeah. but that's it was a big uh, uh, guitar shop called called Chandler Guitars. So it's not the Chandler that was, um, yeah. you know, the, the Yakko units and all that stuff, and and the uh, tube drivers and all those sort of things. Uh, this was Chandler Guitars, which was Doug Chandler and Charlie Chandler and uh, Paula Chandler at the time were running the shop, and uh, Charlie was the guitar fixer and Doug was the, the main guy. They're both guitar players, good guitar players. And it was one of the best shops in London by a lot. I, I loved it. In fact, I ended up working there back in the late eighties and nineties. Doug would get me in and I'd just play all day. And that would bring people into this shop. I was like, it's sort of <laughs> you were like a, a display, uh, uh, you know, like a, display like a, like a nude model of guitars, except, because I actually can't bear doing that now. I actually go, to, I actually clam up completely. And used to go, God, I'm, it's really annoying when you go into a shop and there's some guy kind of, you know, jerking off on the guitar. You know, it's really, really annoying. And uh, that was me back in the <laughs> ages. I used to do that. And 
But I, it's also because I, uh, Dark Hat was one of the first people who had Paul Reed Smith guitars in London. So I got to play the first three that ever arrived in London. Oh, cool. What did you think of them when they first but came out? One in the, well, they were, ha- you know, this is, you know, not against Paul because Paul was very nice to me, very nice to me. And I, I met him and we, uh, I think those three guitars, were, they were the ones. The early, early 10 that I played were handmade by Paul, you know, with real passion and, they were the best. They were the best ones I ever played, and I, wa- I actually wanted one. Um, but when it came became, I, I don't really really know whether how how they do it, the production line there, Paul and Smith. But I, I didn't end up I didn't end up loving them as much as the early ones. Maybe that's just you know just one of those things. But I can't say why. But yeah. uh, I, I definitely didn't. I loved the first three that I played and they, they won after all the stars. You know, I think, I think Mark Knopfler actually got one of those. The red oh, it's a guy, good guy to give it a, yeah. That's a guy and, you uh, want playing your guitars, man. Really? Uh, Gary Moore got one and somebody else got one. And they, they, all these guys were getting them. Everybody was suddenly playing for Smith, but they were, these early ones were really, really something. Um, and just obviously different, but uh, yeah, I didn't end up in, end up with any, and uh, I, I actually went I went a different way. I went back into old guitars. I like old guitars. Vintage. <laughs> Man, let's skip. Sorry, I, I was deviating. What three experiences? So Letterman with Tom Jones oh, yeah. and your brother. <laughs> well, one of the most most enjoyable shows. One of the most enjoyable things I've ever done in my entire life was uh, I did a a musical called Backbeat which was about the Beatles. Um, and I was musical director. And it was a show that went into, eventually went into the West End, ended up in Toronto, and then went to LA. Unfortunately, it was supposed to then go to Broadway. And uh, all I can say is to the producers, no, actually, just say no comment. <laughs> you can keep that in. It all went, uh, it all went up the swanning and everything went wrong. But as a, a as a, as a work for the work that I like to do, it was it fulfilled nearly everything because I was working with actors, which I already knew something about. I was working with directors who I already know something about, and I was a musical director. I learned um, I learned a few sort of special things about uh, writing. I learned that you can actually make. Um, like I was told right at the start, is how are we going to get the Beatles on stage playing live? These guys have to play live. Do we get musicians who can act, or do we get actors who can play music? And I said, you get actors. And they were going, why? And I went, because actors, will, their job is to make you pretend that they're brilliant musicians. And if they're good actors, they will do that. And they will actually become good musicians. That's their job. How long do we need to do that? And I said... Well, in eight weeks, I can get something out of them, you know. So I got them sort of like on a regime of what to do and how to work. And um, even though they'd probably laugh, be laughing if they all heard me talking about this now, um, we achieved something that I just almost think is impossible, you know. I had to get them up to scratch so that it was like them playing at their best when they were in um, uh, Hamburg. Was that, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I had to get them, you know, I had to get, I got the drama with my brother, you know, I had to go in and I just, like the guy playing John Lennon who played guitar, he wasn't actually one of the best singers, but he was actually a really good actor. The guy playing with Paul McCartney could sing really well. Um, his acting needed some, he needed some confidence, that's all. Um, he needed to find out that he was already Paul McCartney anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so somebody says I could help them with all these things as well as be the even though sometimes you don't want the MD telling you acting things but the director that ended up doing the show and I had a real um, amazing sort of like journey together and uh, that's cool man it was it was just great to see these actors go on every night and do this this work and fool people that they've been playing you know that they were the Beatles and they and I think it was, so I, I, I absolutely love that show. Love doing that. Um, because there was, then go musically, 
what else? Um, oh, dear, oh, dear. I mean, I've had so many things, you know. I mean, I, the first night at the Black Crows, when I first played, um, that was the tough one for the Black Crows because really I, I, I knew I was going to do a job because I just never felt like a Black Crow. I felt like an English guy coming over to do something. Um, what were you playing with them? <laughs> well, what, well, what happened? It was just it was just uh, that I knew Chris. I'd been I'd done a couple of solo albums with him, and then I got asked to. Uh, well, actually, I just went, I went down to the show that they did at Shepherd's Bush um, when they sort of came back together, and they got Mark Ford, they got Eddie Harsh, they got the original band. Um, pretty much back together and they did these three shows there and um i'd met mark ford a few times then but he actually came to my studio and we hung out for a bit and i sensed that something wasn't right and he was already doing the shows i said some like something when i say something wasn't right i sensed that maybe there was something about him and the band he wasn't sure about at that particular time um so he went back to the show and I went back to the show with him, watched the show. And then the manager said to me, how do you feel about possibly producing the Black Crows? He said, you've already worked with Chris. And I said, well, that's something I have the trust of Chris. So now all I have to do is get the trust of Rich, you know? So, and that wasn't going to be probably easy because with brothers, it's always, you know, who are you siding with kind of thing. Yeah. So, right. So the, uh, the, you know, to be honest, I wasn't fighting with anybody. Just got to do, make, try and make this work. So um, we were talking about it, and then the next thing, I'm flying to to New York to uh, Electric Ladyland to do a week with Brit Rich, and then the following week to do a week with Chris, who was in LA. So I went to New York, did a week with Rich, went to LA to do a week with Chris, um, and then came flew back. To London we were just trying to see what you know Chris didn't want to do anything that Rich was doing Rich didn't want to do anything that Chris was doing they're both good lot. so you just went to like hang out with them like fuck what am I going to do but I'm hanging out with them and I got on in a completely different way with Rich than I did normally with Chris and we just we got on fine for that week I got on fine for Chris for that week we're just we're just back to normal what yeah. we normally went back home and kind of like wow what am I going to do how am I going to do this this is going to be tough you know, but it's, it's, it's potentially all there, you know, it's like, it's they're, they're both, you know, everybody can play, you know, we can do this live, you know, so it's great. I went home and I suddenly get a call from the manager going, have you heard about Mark Ford? And I'm like, what? No, what, what's happening? He said, Oh, sorry, I'll call you back. I'll call you back. And then Rich calls me and goes, have you heard about Mark Ford? And I'm going, no, what's going on? Like, oh, sorry, man. Call you back. Call you back. Call you back. So it's like all these calls coming in like that, and I'm literally just walking up to the deli just to get a coffee. I just drop my bags at the studio, and I'm going. And uh, so I'm drinking, just drinking my coffee. Came back, and, and then the manager, Pete Angeles, calls me and says, "Mark Ford's left the band." And I said, "What?" He said, "He's left the band. He's gone. We've got a gig tomorrow night." Rich and Chris want you to do it. Want you to do the gig, and I went, "Oh, geez, you get you don't get much prep on your jobs, do you?" And they said, "Can you do it?" And I went, oh, "Yeah, sure, you know, I think so." So I got on a plane, and I—I I mean, I never played any of their music. I played to, with Chris. to where? I, where were you, where was the gig? It was it was outside of New York somewhere. Uh, I can't remember. God, that's uh, a brutal flight to then to go do a gig with shit you don't even know. My God. And then get in the car. The car car arrives car arrives at coach. Put my bags on the coach. Go and say, All right guys, how are you doing? And uh, and then Rich was like got his acoustic guitar out. He's going, Well we're gonna play this number. We haven't got the set list yet, you know. We're playing for two and a half hours, you know. Oh my God. And so, so I just went on stage. But the thing is, is that without, you know, because because I've played in many situations where, you know, you're going to play a jazz gig, you don't know what songs you're playing, you don't know who you're playing with, you don't know what key anything's in, you know. 
So I just looked at, it was Sven, Viper was the bass player. I just said to Sven, I went, listen, you could just help me, because they were all just laughing, thinking that I'm going to be a, you know, I suppose they thought they might, that I might be a total disaster. Um, I get up on stage and I just said to Sven, I said, give me the key of the song at the start and tell me the first chord, tell me what key it's in and tell me if there's a trend, if, if the solo is in a different key. So he goes, yeah, this one's, I think it's in, I think it's in G and it starts on G. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think it goes up to B for the solo. Okay. And they start playing and I just start, I just start playing. Yeah. Some of it was from memory from listening to the records. So I sort of sort of remembered the part. But you but weren't taking the solos anyway. I mean, I was taking the solos. Yeah, oh, I was taking, yeah, oh. I was taking the solos. Yeah, I would have thought. I was, I was taking Mark Ford's place. Holy shit! So I was taking the solos. Of course, you know. I mean, the, the thing, you know, quite often that I used to have with that band is, you know, I'd be. I, th- I can't remember whether it's at this gig because I, I actually kind of really got off on that gig of not knowing the songs at all. So I was not responsible for what I did. So I kind of had. And I mean, they came off after us and they said, I don't know how you did that. And I said, well, if I know what key it's in, I have reasonable relative pitch. So I can, you know, if you're going to go yeah. to B and you're going to go to D, whatever, then um, I'm going to know probably. Um, but uh, it was just trying to get a sensibility of it. And I, I, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed that gig. I probably enjoyed that gig more than some of the other ones because I used to have a line of people with more up, MFF, Mark fucking Ford, <laughs> on T-shirts. And I'd literally play one chord at the start of the set, and they'd all look at each other and shake their heads going, yeah, he's no good. You oh, know? yeah, yeah, that's rough. Oh, oh, and I, I realized that that's, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's I, I, and do you know what? And the funny thing is I kind of understand them. You know, I do understand. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. The, the, the one thing that you get with a band is, you know, you could say, you know, Jimmy Page in Led Zeppelin, you know, but if suddenly Jimmy Page was, wasn't was Jimmy Page anymore and Pete Townsend took over for the night, even though Pete Townsend in The Who would be, you wouldn't want to see anybody else playing with The right. Who. You just, you don't want to see anybody. Yeah. Then the band. You want your guy. You, know, you want your guy. And I yeah. saw, so I totally was, and it sort of takes a lot of convincing to get, um, so I, I got it. But I, what I was also doing is going, but I'm up here trying to convince people that I can get through this gig and do a you know good job. And it was sometimes it was it was tough. I think I think you know with a band like that anyway, you just you need time. You need a good year of playing in and playing these songs. Yeah, and understanding it before you really. But, but funnily enough, that first gig, I almost think I probably played my best on that first gig because I just had no clue what I was playing or what to do. So you were freer in a way. Completely free. Yeah. yeah. I didn't think about anything. I just thought, and I just, it was just great looking over at Chris. I hadn't played with Chris Roy and him smiling his ass off at me, you know, with him. He would just, every time I'd take the solo, that he just, it was just like it was nice to be back on stage with him, you know what I mean? So, Very um, cool, so I, had a, I had a plus. That's, that's another one. So, how many hours did that one take? That question, that answer. No, that was good, man. It was like 10 minutes. <laughs> We're good. We got all three of them. We got Letterman. Backbeat musical director and uh, first night of the yeah. crows. Wow. Man, let's talk about gear for a few minutes. Yeah. This is I love gear. I for, love gear. For you, this is a tough question, man. What's your go-to guitar right now, and what other two guitars would round out your top three? Not that you have to play on sessions; they're just the ones you like playing. The ones I like playing, like uh, at the moment, and I I have got a little story with this one, which is my black strap. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to, to Emerald Guitars in Seattle. Mm-hmm. you know that place? No, um, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that. Emerald Guitars is a sort of vintage guitar shop in, in Seattle. And it was while I was on tour with the Crows. And I was, um, I just wanted, I always wanted to get another strap. I had one of my strap, the strap that I learned to play on was stolen when I was younger. So when I was in my 20s. But the, uh, the black strap was, uh, I went in there and they had three on the wall. They had a 65, they had a 69, and they had a 73. And it was like, you know, at the time, at that time, it was like nine, uh, 2007, 2006, seven. then it was really, guitars were really at a peak of expense. They were expensive. Yeah, the, yeah the, it, it, was a, there was a little, you know, sort of 
blip at that time where everything had become like at Les Paul 59 was like four hundred thousand yeah, dollars yeah. or something. So it was very expensive. And I, so I, there was a. And these were all like, like maple necks. Maple neck black okay. straps, okay. and they were all black yeah. straps. So they looked like Richie Blackmore, which is right. one of my one of my heroes, along with obviously David Gilmore. You know, those two big on the rock side of things. You know, they never two. make. They only made the black strat, like that one here. That's got the ebony neck, but I've never seen him with a rosewood neck. That was like a special thing they came out with, like in two thousand fourteen or fifteen. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Oh no! But you can't usually I get like ebony as well. What's that? I love ebony. Oh my god, that's like <clears throat> oh. wonderful. Yeah, I bet. Anyway, so these three guitars were on the wall. Sixty-five, uh, sixty-five, or sixty-nine, seventy-three. Sixty-five was, I think, twenty thousand uh, dollars. The 69 was $12,000 or something, and the 73 was $4,000. still pretty expensive. Yeah, but uh, nothing compared – relatively. Yes, relatively. Yeah, sure. Then, so obviously, you know, at the time I thought, well, I can afford any of these three, but I really don't want to pay $20,000 for it. I mean, I don't, I don't want to do that. But. So I was thinking if I like the 65, I probably won't buy it. Because I'm too tight, you know. So anyway, so I bought, so I tried the 65, and it was a good one. It, sat, it was great. And then tried the 69, and the 69 was a bad one. It really wasn't any good at all. It was like, no, nah, there's nothing about this that would entice me. Which you know? probably made you feel good, like yeah, it made me yeah. feel good. And I thought, oh, it's going to go down. So now the 73 is going to be a real dog, you know, and forget it. I played the 73, and the 73 blew the other two out the water. Not because of the price. I mean, it just, sonically, everything about it just yeah. sounded so much better. So I have that guitar, and that is still one of my favorite guitars. It's Everything about it is wrong. It's a slightly heavy, three-bolt, 1973 strap. But anyone who plays it has told me that it's, I mean, it's, I know it's Noel Gallagher's favorite guitar that I own. And it's got the standards. It's the original strap pickups. Original strap pickups. That's cool. Man. It's a it's a killer guitar. And so I play solos. I tend to play solos with that guitar in the studio because it's somehow it's not it's not necessarily an easy guitar to play, but it's just something about all its nuances and that it makes me fight a little bit. That guitar. You know what? I've talked to some players, and some players oh. like to fight a guitar. Yeah. They really enjoy that a little bit, you know? I don't like a smooth run. You know, that's why I don't really like any of those. I mean, it's amazing that, you know, you pick up something like a Sur and it's, you know, it's all completely in tune, completely perfect, you know. And I suppose, you know, maybe for a certain kind of music, you'd sort of go, well, that, that would be good. But for me, I, I like, I like a, you know, a bit of grease and mm. a bit of... Um, not for any other reason that I just feel it makes, it's funny. I, I used to not really care about the look of the guitar as well, but, but I think the look of the guitar kind of influences the way you feel about it, which influences the way you play it. Oh yeah. I think so too. So, like, um, so yeah. So suddenly I became real snob about liking guitars that look a certain way. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I like, I like the 73 is great. The other the next one is a, an SG, it's a 64 SG. I bought it probably while I was uh, 99. I was starting to make some money with working with Noel all the time uh, on the Oasis thing. So, um, And that actually used to belong to Johnny Marr. Johnny Marr had his main wow. SG. Wow. 64, I think, and 63 or 64. I can't remember whether it's 63 or 64. For some reason, I just don't really care it's just i just like the guitar I like the way it looks and johnny had his guitar stolen he had an sg he, he used to be he had a, an sg and he had a number two and that was the number two the one i bought was the number two it was one ser it was a serial number away from his number one. Oh wow and he, had, he had number one stolen and i got to play with johnny in uh the Finn Brothers. We did um, we did a couple of Smith songs with him. He got up and he played. I gave him my SG and he was going, "This was mine." And he's going, "Oh yeah." And then he said, "Can I buy it back?" And I went, 
I'm so sorry, mate. I'd love to, but because he is one of the nicest guys around, I tell you. And um, I love his playing, man. Yeah, I like love his playing as well. He's 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 uh he is really one of the good guys around. And uh, but I I really wanted to be able to say yes, but I I need you know. No, I mean he's. I'm sure he gets it. Yeah, well, he's. Then it wasn't long after that he got his back. They finally got it, so he's now got number one back. And now he's playing Jaguars anyway. So, um, but that's a, that's that one. That one's just uh, it's got something about it. Again, not the easiest SG to play. Some people pick it up thinking they're going to have a nice smooth ride, and they go, "God, this is not so too easy." It's got a little bit of fight in it. And the other one is um, uh, 1966 335 red 335. Bought from my by my dad on my sixteenth birthday. Wow, that's really nice, man. Is, you, is your dad old. still around? Yeah. Oh, that's great. And he just—that um, was when, obviously. I mean, by that time, I was trying to learn jazz guitar, and was trying to be in Nigel, the National Youth Jazz Orchestra. So I was actually starting to think about going to the rehearsals. I was too nervous to go to start with, and. Um, that's a nice. That's a I, nice present. That's an unbelievable present, and it's it's still one of the better guitars that I own. It's, it's something about it. Every time I've um, it's a dot. No, it's it's a block. Block. Interesting. Sixty six. So it's got the thinner neck. Some people say the neck's too thin, but actually, um, again, I played the bigger necks. I like big necks, thin necks. They all have something right. else to something to other. Are you a big guy? Like, are you tall? No, three, but there is one other one I wanted to tell you about. No, that's cool. Are you a big guy? Are you? Uh, no. Six foot. Okay. You have big hands? Or... Uh, do you know what? Um, not especially big hands, but uh, yeah. incredibly strong. Yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Ladies. <laughs> incredibly strong and virile. Paul Stacy. There you go. <laughs> Um, that's the first response I've had to you. You a big guy that came out like that. Okay, <laughs> yeah. there you go. Okay. And what was the last guitar? A ruder response than that. But anyway, the um, the last was the, the last guitar was um, uh, an ES artist. What is that? It's strange because um, well, it's just something I'm toying with and have been. I've I've always toyed with guitar synthesis. Um, I had um, look that up. I had a GR7, uh, GR700 when I was 21. I bought GR700. I was obsessed with guitar synth. And, um, and I got all the VG stuff, you know, the VG99 and GR5, whatever it's called, 55 or whatever. And then I've always liked this uh, modeling, the possibility whether the modeling thing could actually work, you know. Um, but I didn't really want to buy Variax, even though, pretty good you know I've, I've never kind of gotten to sound good or to work properly but i'm still pursuing this whole thing with the 13 pin thing so i found a. I, I, I like 335s I, ha, I actually own another 335 i own a 68 but i also like um i have a 330 as well and i have a casino and i have a man i've heard so many nice things about those uh, late 60s yeah. epiphone casinos yeah, this one is an early one. This is a 62. Wow. I've got a head start 62 with a big speed. And that's a, that's a pretty good guitar, but the 330, I've got a 61 330, and that is a killer guitar. That's what is the difference between a 330 and a 335? The size? 330, 330 doesn't have the block through it, and it's, so it's P90. Total hollow body with P90s. Like it's, it's basically like a casino. But they, sort of don't, no, they don't sound the same. Uh, casinos in... 330s. I think I, I mean, the coolest, you know, the, the cool thing to say is that the casino is the cooler guitar. But actually, personally, I'm going to be on call here and say that I think 330 is one of the coolest, one of the coolest recording guitars as well. That's cool, man. Sweet sounding thing. And, um, but the, um, but this ES artist, so I, I've got into that, you know, I like 335s. I've been playing a lot of 335s recently, and the red one being number one. I was uh, 30th Street Guitars again, Matt, at 30th Street Guitars. I was trying, I, I just walked in there one day and said, 
he got a um, player's guitar. Man, you must walk into these places. You got like a wing named after you, and all these. They they see you, and their eyes light up. <laughs> I'm nothing that they know me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sorry, terrible. Really Paul, terrible. we got to play this. We yeah, have well, this that, waiting that was, for you. He didn't have anything to play because I just said I'm not spending any. I said you got a nice cheap player's guitar, you know, and he kind of laughed and then he said, "Well, actually, just check out that ES artist." And this ES artist was um, was when Gibson, you know, when Ibanez was sort of like really having their shot at the, like 78, 79. And yes, yeah, so George Benson was, um, he was playing Ibanez and then I think John Schofield was playing Ibanez. And so a lot of people, uh, I think Lee Rittenau was playing Ibanez. Um, so yeah, basically suddenly I think Gibson was sort of losing their, their touch a little bit. So they came out with a series called the ES artist and, um, I tried this guitar and I liked it. It was uh, it was not like a three three five quite. It was not like a three five five quite, but it has an ebony fingerboard and it has no f holes, so it's actually like the like the Lucille, like mm, BB yeah. Lucille. And it had that sort of sound to it. And um, but it used to have the Moog electronics in the, in the back, so I got the, the, the Moog electronics were out, so the guitar was cheap. It was just cheap, cheap, cheap. But a really good guitar. So I've had a uh, system installed in it called the uh, – oh, I thought I knew what it was called. The GraphTech, GraphTech system, that's right. So now it has a 13-pin uh, thing on it, and it has a – their Piazza pickup, so there's like it's, – so it's got the acoustic sound. Uh, so, yeah, it's a really cool guitar. I just, cool. I just looked it up when you mentioned it. it looks, it's like a it looks like a hybrid of a three thirty five. Yeah, that's right. It's cool looking, man. With ebony fingerboard, and it's uh, yeah. So that's that's a guitar that's slowly becoming um, yeah, could be could become my favorite in some ways because it's that much you like it. I, I, yeah, it's like it's because it's kind of unique, and as we talked before the program started. <laughs> It's that um, uniqueness is to be to me. It's the only reason to do anything, because why would you want to do something like somebody else does it? Yeah. Doesn't I mean you, you're going to have to be influenced by somebody to get yourself started? But you know, and I hate myself when I play cliches, you know, or I'm cliched in my approach, you know. But I just don't understand why people copy people, you know. So the thing that's nice about this guitar. Is that it's an oddball, slightly oddball, but with these piatto, there with the uh, graph tech system in it, it makes it into something quite different. And it's acoustic. You can play it acoustic or electric. Well, I can play. It, I can get like a really dark sound on the the neck pickup. You know, like fat dark sound. And if I just wind in a bit of the, the, the you know, the that pickup, uh, then I get this like like a little acoustic edge on top of it. You can get all these different sounds that you really can't get from just, you know, regular, you know, pickup. And um, and it doesn't, and even acoustically, obviously, it doesn't sound like um, it doesn't sound like an acoustic quiet. Actually, as you know, a plugged in acoustic usually half the time sounds so bad, yeah. so such a terrible sound. But um, this actually sounds very usable, very nice. So so yeah, and then I'm using some of the you know. VG stuff, the um, virtual guitar stuff with that, with the real guitar to the two together. You got it. Nice. Yeah, I like, I like it. And you can do things with tunings, you know, so you can ch- suddenly, or you can have a sitar and guitar, or you can have a guitar, a baritone guitar suddenly, or you can have a, so it's kind of like, instead of, you know, having one of those stands that like, you know, Yes used to have where he'd have to run up to the sitar and do his little bit in the middle. You've actually got it on the guitar you're playing, and you just have to switch it in and switch it out. And That's cool, actually. It's very cool. It's a very cool. Um, it's it's a very liberating thing because when I really, really get bored of my own playing, you know, which is usually after about the first five minutes, <laughs> just switch something and something happens, and then suddenly the guitar doesn't sound quite the same anymore. And I go, "Oh, that sounds better," you know. Hopefully, will inspire me to play something that I like. Yeah, right. It pushes you. You need a prompt sometimes. Yeah, a prod. A prod. <laughs> yes. Yes. Paul, Desert Island Discs, top three, just for today. Wow. 
knowing you could change? Beatles. Uh, Duraflay's Requiem, Voices of Ascension, that, that version. That's the best, best version. What is, um, say that again. Voices of Ascension. Who's the band? It's, it's, it's the, the version. It's by, it's by Morris Durf, uh, Duraflay, com- classical composer. It's okay. composed on organ, and it's, it's called, uh, it's his, his Requiem. It's, uh, Voices of Ascension. Well, Voices of Ascension is, is sorry, is, there's loads of different versions in the classical shops to go to buy on CD. But the only version that I really think is the best, for, is worth the one worth listening to, is uh, it has on the front of the CD cover "Voices of Ascension," but it is Duraflay's Requiem, which is just one of the most beautiful pieces uh, I've ever written. I'll have to check it out. And, uh, so that's a that would be a disc. So what have I got so far? Have I got anything with Rock and Oh yes, of course, White Album. Yes, that um, I've got. I've got one left. Shit. It would be very hard to say what that would be. Uh, let me see if I can just... I don't know. Only the Lonely Frank Sinatra. There we go. There you go. Sorry, I mean, I'd love to... I mean, I'd be, I'd be in hell if I had to just pick, you know... Yeah, it's very tough. Three three records is kind of crazy. The thing is, not good. I mean, could you say three guitar records? No. No, whatever you want, man. Yeah, no, I mean, if I said three guitar records, then it would obviously Alan Holdsworth's Secrets. <laughs> but um, he's a. Uh, I know the jazz isn't for everyone, but uh, it's not jazz. It's it's Alan Holdsworth's whole concept of music. But that's his one of my favorite albums by him. Anyway, well, what else do you need to know? <laughs> Best decision you ever made. I think the best decision I ever made was <laughs> Jesus. Best decision you ever made was Jesus? No. <laughs> <laughs> Even though, you know, who knows? There must have been a guy around then doing something, you know, <laughs> making some waves, you know. Um I, I, I suppose uh, I'd, I'd say the best decision I ever made was deciding to go to uh, for for my work for my life. The life part of life, living is to go to drama center because I was taught by these two guys at drama center, and they taught me about art. And as far as I'm concerned, they they actually knew what it was. So. They taught, as I say, they were the acting teachers who taught Hopkins, and you know, they were uh, the two guys running the place were remarkable people. So this is a tough question. You know? <laughs> but the rest of them kind of are. What do you like most about yourself? I'm honest. It was good, man. Even how you said that was cool. Well, I mean, the thing is, is it's it's a drag because I have so much more money and so much more sort of like <laughs> things. If I was dishonest, I, it's, it's sort of like a kind of like it's a bit of a drag. But I struggle with being dishonest. It's not. I'm not very good at doing it. I'm, I didn't. I didn't want you to think that I haven't been dishonest. I have, but I cannot live with it. I just can't, I can't live with being like that. So I have to, uh, I've made a few mistakes in my life. Those are the ones that, those are my biggest regrets was when I was dishonest. Yeah, yeah. So, so I live for honesty, um, but it would be handy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> if you had like a, just like three, you get three dishonest cards to pull during your life or something, right? Um, how about the flip side, man? If there's one thing you could change about yourself, what would you want it to do? What would you want that thing to be? Uh, if I could change something, is that I have um, I have a problem with uh, uh, nerves. I get nervous. Oh, okay. Like you get anxious and stuff. Uh, I don't get anxious much. It's just that I've, I've been in situations like I where 
if I, I don't like something, if I've got, like I said, music, if there's some music I don't like, then um, I, I become unreasonably anxious, if you like. Like I can't. Like buy. anxious or irritated? Yeah, like I can't. I, well, I, I'm sort of annoyed sometimes with myself and not having a better idea of how to deal with music that I don't like. And why does it matter? It's, you know, it's a piece of music that you don't like. So big deal. What's the problem? Yeah. And I become completely, what happens is I become, fr I fr freeze, I become like stone and I freeze. And I actually watch it happen sometimes and I can't do anything about it. Wow. Is that only with music or is it like if there's a, I've it, no, I've had it with acting as well. I've had it with, uh, when I don't, it's almost like I don't understand and I'm embarrassed. Do you see what I mean? Oh. You know, when like somebody says to you, oh, you know, they're talking about something and you go, oh, I, I don't, I don't know what they mean. And it's embarrassing that you don't know what you mean. Now, some, again, it's again to do with honesty and stuff, I suppose. But yeah. sometimes you go, oh, that'd be great if I could just kind of bullshit my way through this and pretend I know exactly what I'm talking about. But I cannot do it. Yeah. Even if I even if I tried to, I can't do it. It's, it's probably like, it's not possible for me. Well, I, always I always look like the idiot. I'm the guy who says, "Well, I don't know what that is. Can you explain it to me?" And I'm the. So I always well, no, in that situation. Actually, that's what I do. But what I'm saying is, sometimes in a situation with music where you know somebody's just like you're just about to play, and something something comes up that you just go, have, like you know, if you've been booked for a session. You know, I've been booked for a session, and they played me the song, and I've just gone, this is the worst shit I've ever heard. Uh, okay. I cannot stand it. And then all I want to do is just say, I mean, probably, you know, and this is, again, to do with honesty, you know, is that I, I sort of go, well, I think I could probably help this track if I, if I can talk them out of taking that away, getting rid of the singer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, just a little it, tweak like that. Just a little tweak. Well, just say like, yeah, if you could just, maybe I can add something to this. Little, but you kind of know that you've been duped into doing a session. Yeah. You weren't really meant to be on because, I mean, I I have an actual true story session that I won't mention the artist and that, but I was actually asked to come and play guitar on it. And when I ended up going to play guitar on it, I listened to the song and it sounded like a dance song, like any old dance song. And everybody was high-fiving about how great it was, the song. And I didn't know what to play. I mean, or what I thought is, why didn't I bring my synthesizers down and a couple of effects? Because I could kill you with something on this with that sound. But what I ended up with doing guitar that sounded like a synthesizer with a, you know, even tied pedal. Yeah. I was really annoyed because I brought all these, these guitars down. And that, I assume that that's because they wanted guitar on it. So that's what I was doing the session for. So I didn't have the right tools with me, so I only had a guitar. So I tried to make the guitar sound like a synth, and they used all of it, and they liked it, you know. But I thought the whole thing sucked from yeah. start to end. Yeah, it sounds like your standards are super high. I, would, I don't even know if they're high. I mean, I don't know what they are. They're just my standards, and yeah. my standards are that this, this, this is a shit song, you know. And it doesn't matter how much what. You know, I can't. I, I don't know what to do. I can't even polish this turd. You know what I mean? Was it released? Was it released? Oh yeah. Did it do well? Uh, I think uh, some people would say that it did well because all the guys that were high fiving it were doing well because they wanted to keep their jobs. You know. But no, but I mean, did it actually sell? Or like, was uh, it played? Well, or? Yeah, because the artist sells sells yeah. records anyway. Yeah. Um, no matter what, but. It, I've, actually, after that session, I decided that I never wanted to do a session again. <laughs> wow! And then, yeah, that, I, I, after that one, I, I, I mean, this isn't obviously very useful for me because people think, you know, we should get Paul in to do some sessions for us. But actually, it wasn't that. It was just to do with don't get me in to do sessions that uh, any guitarist, that a certain session guitarist would do with ease, because that isn't my thing. What I'd rather do is. So if I can come in and do a track and listen to a track and say, this is a very interesting piece of music and I might be able to do something on it that I think would enhance the interest, then I, then I'm probably say, would, I would say I am your man. Yeah. But, that, but if you're going to play something that sounds like regular, you know, chart material of now, 
I wouldn't know what I don't want to play it because I don't like it anyway. Well, you're just consistent with what you've oh, you've said throughout. Is like I like doing stuff I enjoy. You know, I'm 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 inspired to perform well when I enjoy something. That's just yeah, pretty I'm, consistent. I'm in a lucky position now because I'm not somebody who's going to, you know, some some, you know, friends of mine make a living from playing guitar because they have a, they have something that they, you know, they have to provide for their families and everything, and they have. It's it's to do with money, you know, and I have no, I, I don't feel badly about that. I think good luck to them for that. It's just I I just don't want to do that. That's all. Yeah, I get it. So I mean, maybe maybe I sometimes think maybe I should just should I should just shut my mouth and do it. So I've tried to do that, and then I still can't do it. So I just end up just going. Well, if you can't oh. do it, you can't do it. Yeah, no, I just go. This sucks. This is awful, and and I freeze or sort of like become like anxious because I just go. I just, it's like, yeah, it's something I, I can't do. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, who's had the biggest influence on your life musically and personally? Probably, um, There's many, but I'd say just because of the, I'd have to base it on the last few years, I'd say probably Kurt Rosenwinkel, just hanging around him, um, I think was was big. Would he be the, so, for both, musically and personally, or just musically? Oh, sorry. Did, did you say personally as well? <laughs> yeah, musically, like two, probably two separate people. I mean, maybe it's one person. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't mean that. That it wouldn't be because personally as well. I mean, he's he's a very unique individual. You know, um, he's an amazing guy and an amazing music and one of the best musicians I've ever been around. And when I say best, I mean that he's just inspired. You know, um, do you have any hobbies outside of music? Uh, yeah, photography. What kind of what kind, would you like to shoot? Sort of like, a, a, I mean, it's a sort of street photography, like, you know. Oh, yeah, that's, like, what I, that's what I do. I love that. Yeah. Is there anything you regret not doing? Well, I always just say this, that I think I spent a long time in my early part of my life not being brave enough to stick to my guns of what, what I believe in. Like, what, like, like, because it's very easy to listen to other people and take criticism. You know, a lot of people get criticized on their way when they're learning to play or if they want to do something. Um, and even though I got a lot of encouragement when I started with my parents, my, my parents were very encouraging in terms of buying, helping me buy a uh, Ford gear and stuff. I still sort of, I, I know I was very, I was sort of slightly frightened by not uh, being qualified to do the job that I was being asked to do. And that was always my thing is that I want to be able to do it and I want to make sure that I can really do it well. And like when you're playing with jazz musicians, you know, there's always somebody looking down your nose sort of going, oh, well, he's not, he hasn't kind of studied this or hasn't got this together or blah, blah, blah. It's, this is. So I was always nervous, you know, about those sort of things. But I, I wish... Um, I wish I'd learned. I, I don't get so bad these days, you know, sort of found ways to do it. And it's just to do with that. You've got to be forthright about what, what it is you do. You've got to be honest with yourself about what you do. So yes, I just wish I'd been. Got there. I wish I got there quicker than it's not like I've got there. or I'm not able to like fall. Now I can occasionally fall and, not do as well as I want to do. And I'm very critical about my own playing and and what I do. But at the same time, I also know now kind of, that's it. That's what I'm capable of. So that's that's where it's going to be. And I maybe can make small improvements, but it's not going to get much better than this, you know. No, that's yeah, I totally get it, man. That's like part of getting older. You're much more comfortable in your own skin, I think. Yeah, I'm comfortable being the rat that I am. You yeah. Know. You're more accepting of your wrinkles, I guess. Yeah. And I la I <laughs> <laughs> what's, 
Last question, man. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that change has been deliberate and how much is just a natural part of aging? You, you have to accept what you can do and who you are and you have to be honest about what you do and who you are. And you're never going to please everybody. So that's something I think I've become actually quite a bit stronger in the last 10 years and just accepting that I've learned to do this, I've learned to do that, and I can do this, and I can do it this way, but I can't do it your way. I can do it my way. And if you don't want my way, unless I'm willing to sort of go, I'll give that a try, I'm, I'm getting a bit long in the tooth to be able to sort of say, oh, yes, I want to learn. I mean, I, I want to learn more all the time, but what I'm saying is I've kind of accepted what my limitations are. And uh, I'm trying to use them um, to expand. I'm, I'm actually, I think the limitations are good. You can't, yeah. do, you can't do everything. And I've had very much a life of doing quite a lot of things. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of, uh, I felt stronger. Yeah. Man, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, actually. What's that? I'm more of a pain in the ass than I've ever been. <laughs> no, man, you sound like you're just more uh, confident and more willing to be yourself. Yeah. Which is always a plus for everything, man. Everybody involved. I suppose I would say I'm not a follower. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I didn't ask you that question. Yeah. I knew that. I'm not really a follower. I don't really follow anybody much. But, uh, I mean, there's a few people that I, I hold in high esteem. But there's only a few, you know, that's it. <laughs> I told you, man, that circle is small, dude. Yeah, that's small. Yeah, it's, it's small. Yeah, that's it. That's it, that's it probably, in a nutshell, you know. Paul, I can't thank you enough for everything, your time. You're, I really appreciate your stories, man, and for being so transparent. Listen, if you want to uh, check out Paul, uh, first thing you should do is check out his playing. Um, there's a couple of places you can listen to him. Stephen Wilson, his last record. Look at the song called Refuge. Paul Stacy is playing the solo there. And Paul spells his last name, S-T-A-C-E-Y. Also, there's a great clip online with him playing with Tom Jones. He talked about it during the interview with uh, his brother, Jeremy Stacy on drums. It's called Burning Hell, and it's on the David Letterman show. So look up Burning Hell, David Letterman, Tom Jones. And if you are interested in having Paul potentially work with you, either as a producer or an engineer who's going to help you with your mixes, and uh, you're interested in even having him play guitar, um, I'm going to give you his email, but a couple of, of things, just um, you know, be a little detailed what you're looking for, you know, and, uh, give them some information and then, you know, maybe send them that the tracks that you're looking at. And, um, if he feels he can contribute to it, he'll, you know, he will, you know, connect with you guys. And his email address is Paul Stacy. Again, it's Paul Stacy, S T A C E Y at Mac.com. And, um, that's about it, man. Any uh, final words of wisdom? Keep doing it. Keep doing I enjoyed I enjoyed uh, your interviewing Craig. It was, um, that wasn't it wasn't like an interview. That was like talking to an old friend, you know. Well, good man. When I come to England, we can <laughs> make you. we'll make it official. We'll have a drink. <laughs> I'll find out the real dark Stacy secrets at that point. Oh, um, no. I've seen them now. <laughs> man, thank you for everything. I really enjoyed this. I'm glad we got to connect. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Everybody, thanks. Th cheers, man. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it with a friend on your social media channels. We appreciate your support and help with this. Thanks again to Paul Stacy for spending time with us. I really appreciate it and uh, support Paul and his music. He'll, he's going to be coming out with, he's got some albums coming out and um, I think in the future he'll come back on the show and we'll talk about those when they drop. And make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.
Thank you.